suppose what we'll do now is we have the goals for you and Team Liquid in 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 twenty twenty one. Don't you dare say win the major. Why not? Well, because when the major is not going to happen, what are we still all crazy and we think the world's going to fix itself in a couple of months? I no think one. the major is going to happen. Oh, I th- Jason. I think the major is going to happen and I'm going to win that son of a Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Counter-Strike fans all over the globe, welcome to HTV Confirmed Season 5, Episode 30. Uh, it's the season that just keeps on giving, apparently. Uh, but before we get stuck into things, let's uh, have a quick word here from, well, not from our sponsors, about our sponsors, ExtraFi. Uh, they they support the show, they get it done. That's ExtraFi.com, X-T-R-F-Y.com, if you want to check it out for all your peripheral needs. And uh, if you're just tuning in and maybe you're an audio listener, you're not here live, I'll give you the tidbits, the stuff we're going to be diving into tonight. We've got the recent news and roster changes. Obviously, Kenny out of G2. We've got Obo in the mix, talking North American Counter-Strike, ESL Pro League Season 13. And our special guest tonight in the hot seat will be Mr. Jason Moses O'Toole. But before we get there, we need to check in with everybody else. Uh, the regular crew, as it were. Lucas, mate, uh, how do you say fire in Danish? Brat. Ah? Brat. <laughs> Did you just puke? No, you- no, that's that's <laughs> actually the work. Okay. Brand. Okay, can you now say the production room is on fire? Der er ild i produktionsrummet. All right. Someone clip that, send it to Martin. We'll get him fired and uh we'll, we'll get a new producer in here, but no, uh, look, let's keep this one moving. Lucas is lovely. I don't want to I don't want to make too many jokes at his expense. Striker, I got questions for you. Okay. Now, as cool. been revealed recently, we are building you a dating profile. Okay. Uh, I don't know who's doing it. Someone is. Someone's collecting all the data. But I have a I question. Mean, you're, you're doing all the, all the I'm questions. I'm asking the right questions. There. I'm not building the database. Someone out there is building the perfect model for your significant other, right? Cool. Now, I have a question for you tonight. Now, it's an either or. You have to pick one of the others. I don't want you to go, but what about this? Or okay, what about okay. that? You got to pick one of the other. So here's your options. Option one is a night in on the couch, a big bowl of popcorn. You've got your Netflix or any legal subscription-based streaming service available. Cuddled up to your significant other in your hoodie and your trackies, you know, real comfy. Or the alternative is dressed up to the nines. You've got a limo. This is obviously pre-COVID or after COVID. Michelin star can restaurant. I, can I just stop you there and pick the option number one? Like, this is so obvious already. Okay. I want All to right. know what the other options are. I, but, okay, good. Limo's option, sounding nice so far. Yeah, option two. So dressed up, you know, you got, you, you got your tux on, your suit on, whatever you got. You're in a limo. You're going to a Michelin star restaurant. Uh, you know, candlelit dinner, it's romantic, and you, you're gazing deeply into the eyes of your significant other. Now, that was the Jason. This isn't for you, this is for Striker, but where right, would you right. lean? Can uh, you sell him on the second one? Yeah, well, I mean, listen, dude, you always need a date night. You know, you need to get out there. You get, you yeah. know, these relationships, it's important that you continue dating throughout the relationship. You're never done dating your significant other. And that's, that's a nice way to mix things up. You've just spent a year and a half. On, on your couch, couch yeah. with some popcorn, with your legal streaming device. Um, now you need to get out there and you need to experience the show, social life again. Limo is a good touch. You're definitely getting getting something for that. Uh, Michelin star restaurant, that's great. Food's going to be delicious. I think you're missing a great opportunity here for, for one great. Great night and a very, very special moment for the significant other. <laughs> I think I think Jason's taken over Prop's title as the relationship <laughs> advice expert. Definitely <laughs> slid into the relationship expert role for, for this episode, well, it seems like. This is perfect because, Prof, actually, I was moving you out of the relationship advice more into moral dilemmas. Because okay. this is the question I have for you to kick off tonight. Sure, yeah, I'm awesome in that department. So, so just so. quickly for the record, with with Striker, he'd prefer to be on the couch. Note that one down. Get it in his profile. Right? I don't know what it's going to be. Create him one. 
or don't. I don't think I can legally There's say. Some interesting a profile. Somebody's already put some some of that. Some of it together. Made, some it's made a Tinder profile with some of this information. <laughs> the open to the idea of aliens, no piercings, didn't hate any of his teachers. Thinks Toy Story was pretty good. <laughs> Has never laid in bed all day watching anime and picks Grizzly Bear over Great White Shark in a fight. Toy fun. Story there was go. pretty good. That that gets you matched on Tinder for sure. I'm 100 percent sure about that. <laughs> all right. Uh, Prof, here's the question I have, right? So we're pivoting you to Moral Dilemma. Now, I binge watched over the last couple of days a TV show called Snowpiercer, also was a movie. Oh but I quickly want to catch you up on just the concept. I of know, how I watched that... the first episode. You know it? Okay, well, I'm not going to spoil any of it for you, but you understand the premise that this train is built. It's to save humanity because the whole world is frozen over and everybody's going to die. Now, these people who are not meant to be on the train, they don't have a ticket. They, they get the on the train. Now, here's the moral dilemma. Are you a stickler for the rules? And do you think that these motherfuckers, they don't have a ticket on the train. Now they're trying to take over the bloody train. Should we just get rid of those kind of people? Or do we care about the greater picture of humanity and we should be one with mankind? You probably just like pick the best of them and then kick out the rest. That's that's my... I like how you've gone down the middle here. Yeah. For me, it's like, get them the fuck off. They don't have I a I think there's ticket. probably like someone that that's worth it, you know. Like, he's gone uh, He's gone from the one moral question to introducing the new moral question, which is how do you judge the people who are useful from not useful? That's I mean, true. You've just introduced a third, another moral dilemma into the equation. All right, yeah. well. Moral Rob, algebra, I think they call me. <laughs> we might need you to, to write an essay on that one between uh, this show and next week's show. So, because we've got a lot to get through tonight. Uh, now, look. We've obviously had Jason pipe up a couple of times here, so I don't need to give him like a crazy formal introduction right now. I'm going to save that for after the bumper. But Jason, I do have a question for you. This one has been tailored for you specifically here this evening. Okay. Now, I want to preface this. If anybody in here is going to get on the bloody smooth your bandwagon with this question, you, you this is in chat. Just just, just call it down. Smooth your made it a twit longer. You know, he's he made a mistake. It's all good. But the question is still an interesting one. So here's the hypothetical. If one of your players, so somebody in Liquid at the moment or somebody that you were coaching, said GG well played and quit the server before the game ended and the player left alive went on to win the round and then you won the game in overtime, would you punish said player who rage quit? If so, how? Um, Probably probably not. If it happened multiple times, I think that would... I mean, it would certainly be a conversation. And I think um, it would a lot of how I would handle it moving forward would be on how they, they responded. I think if it was something where someone did that and then didn't even see why it was a problem or didn't see why it was causing an issue or see why you know his teammates may not appreciate that or why I might not appreciate it, then the next time it happens would probably have to be a punishment. If it was, if it was something where like he was obviously like, yeah, that was, that was fucking stupid. I'm my bad. And I made a mistake. I mean, you just kind of have to play it, play it by ear the next time. I don't think like hardcore punishments are always, uh, are always the answers like putting the foot down. So it would have to be pretty bad to get to that point to have like a blanket, blanket punishment right out of the gates so a learning experience for all involved all right that, yeah. that sounds doable now uh, let's get this one underway lucas roll the bumper let's get into the hot seat all right we're back jason did you ever think i'd be the host of anything yes actually i here we I, go I knew it pretty quick. Here we no, go. It's it's because it's because you're 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 good and you like to keep keep things moving. So I mean, I I didn't know if it would happen, but I knew you'd be good at it if if you did it. You know, starting it's with compliments, of, it's a great yeah. place to start. Uh, it's uh, I mean, it's we all on air. Eventually, you start to notice, like you know, it seems intimidating at first, and then when you start doing it, like I remember hosting my first show, and I was I thought it was crazy that I was doing it, but. Man, you're fine. You're doing good. All right, cool. I don't like looking down the barrel of the camera when we're doing actual stuff. This I is don't fine because I'm in my own bedroom, so it's all good. Um, all right, so here's the official introduction, Jason. I'll save in this one. This is the one, the only legend of North American Counter-Strike, player turned analyst turned coach of iconic team Liquid, and my friend, Jason Moses O'Toole. We've got him on the show this evening. Uh, Jason, we have a lot to go over tonight, and uh, I, I feel that we may get stuck into the hot seat for, for a decent chunk of time. So I hope you're ready to, to go through yeah, history. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have to start with, uh, and it's been some time, so I'm sure that your your view on this has, has changed. Moving away from uh, being on this side of the fence to, to being a coach, that transition, uh, how did it come about? Why did you eventually pull the trigger? Uh, yeah, basically a bit of backstory and all that. Um, Very yeah, broad. I, 
Yeah, I, 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 well, I mean, first of all, I, I do, I think that's uh, being on that side of the camera, being like casting and analyst work and being on shows and everything a lot is, 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 is a lot of fun. Um, but I just, I don't know. I, I got to a point where I didn't really see a great, great future in it. Although I would say the reason, I, the biggest reason I pulled the trigger on, on coaching was it had some, been something that I considered obviously really, really early on in, in commentary career. When I switched over, I'd had like a couple offers like way early and a couple like initial talks like back in like, you know, 2015, 2016. And it was always something that kind of intrigued me to see what it would be like and to see if I could do it. Um, but I didn't feel like the role or the resources were um, were fully fleshed out to do it in a way where I thought it would be it would be a good decision. So um, mostly I got, I got to the point where when I when I, when I had the offer from Liquid in front of me, it was kind of like um, it was like it, there's never going to be a better opportunity to do it. Like you know the reputation that Team Liquid has as an organization, the team being what it was, um, you know you know, returning a team to the top instead of, you know, starting from, from the bottom and trying to build an entirely new project, um, which would have been in my, my opinion, much more intimidating, but I just felt like if there was ever a time to do it and kind of really put my mind to it and overcome the obstacles that it was certainly going to, going to present, it would be with this organization, with this team, you know, basically at this time. Um, so that, that kind of got me, that kind of got me excited. And, um, that, that's the biggest reason why I switched into it. Uh, I think another, I mean, this small, like ancillary reasoning behind it, um, obviously with commentary, I got to a point where I didn't see a real clear path forward with any of the TOs who were resistant to kind of bringing us on um, exclusively in their favor, although that's kind of happening naturally as it is already, it seems, from my point of view. Um, but I mean, you know, we we I pitched a couple ideas to different TOs about coming on exclusively and just working their product, about being more involved, about fleshing out ideas of different content I wanted to create, marketing content for events. Uh, historical content for fun. Um, you know, I wanted to do more stuff, like more of like the kind of skits that you guys did at Pro League and that Flashpoint has been doing, where those skits could be tailored more towards the companies that you'd be bringing on as a sponsor, so they actually have you know tailor-made advertising. You know, things things like that. And and pretty much everywhere I went, there was a brick wall for one for one reason or the other. And I started to really kind of think about what the future of being like a full-time commentator looked like. Um, and I think the only real way to do it now, I almost feel like to do it appropriately, you almost have to be like a content creator. You have to be like a streamer on the side and you have to have like a YouTube channel. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys can can break the mold and prove me wrong. But I, but I felt like that was that's one of those positions that's best served for those people who can bring kind of their own audience into it and not have to rely on a freelance daily rate and not have to rely on juggling, you know, six different relationships between the different TOs. And um, I think a lot of that was just the grind of it kind of kind of wore me down to a degree where I was just ready to kind of, you know, find something fresh and different. And I wasn't getting that from from commentary. All right. I, I can add a bit of context for people for this. This what Jason's saying here is a pretty familiar sentiment, right? That we've had Yanko go. Uh, we we had he's back, obviously. We had Henry go. We've obviously had a, had a lot of names who have disappeared for whatever reason. But the 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 reason that people should probably hear what Jason's saying and take it as as the fact that shit was pretty bad is the fact that Jason from the beginning, when I walked into this world, was the person who said to me. Um, you know, <laughs> do, you know keep, advice this turned keep, out to be. Well, it was basically, you know, to keep trying, right? To to keep trying to get past all those hurdles that you're talking about right there. Um, and and a lot of those hurdles we either still have now or we're slowly breaking them down. But it has taken. When did I start doing this? Years. 2016, and you yeah. guys were doing it for years Price. before me. Yeah, and it's it's hard too because. I think the biggest obstacle that, that we always had, and I know Anders and I used to just laugh about this, about how frustrating it is, is you'd often, you can bring up ideas and kind of come up with different content ideas or different plans or something you want to try to implement or, and just something that maybe needs a little bit more fleshed out. And we would pitch it to people at different companies and we would just hear back, no. And it wasn't like your idea is too big of a scale. Your idea is not the content we're looking for. Or we want it geared more in this direction. We want something shorter. We want something longer. It was never like, this is why we think this isn't a great idea for us. It was just no. And so you kept going back to the drawing board. But you know, in theory, it was always kind of like, let me pitch this idea and then see where they steer me after that. And then you can come back with a new idea. And there wasn't even that level of of direction or that level of, of, you know, feeling of like you were working with the TO in that way. Um, so things like that just got, just got slowly more and more frustrating. 
Um, and I think eventually it kind of got to a point too, where we were kind of working ourselves to death with all the travel and all the events that we were doing. And then you kind of start to get so tired and so exhausted. And this is something that I only really have thought about and discovered since I've started coaching and looking back on it is it's just like, I feel like there were, there were opportunities out there that I was, that I missed because I was just so like blinded by being exhausted. Maybe I didn't appreciate how good of an offer it was at the time because I was just stuck in this line of thinking because things weren't going a certain way. So I don't know. It just became like very convoluted and it just became like a very stressed environment and very just, I mean, not that I, mind having it's not not about being too stressed but it was just like a situation that just wasn't healthy in about 10 different ways sure all right what, uh, yeah go what would it have taken for you to to stay in broadcasting would it have to be like a i don't know i maybe this is a this is a bad example to put to bring up now but something like a you know thorin's uh role that he had in flashpoint as kind of like a creative director type uh, uh type role is that what, what you would have wanted that would have been, I mean, that would have been cool. Obviously, that's a little bit of like shooting for the fence in terms of a of a home run of going that route. Um, I, I just, I, I wanted to feel, I'm someone who, who I, I need, I want to feel like I'm part of a project. I'm like much more like team oriented than, than like individually solo oriented. So I wanted to feel like I was actually working with with esl to build a better product and i wanted to feel like i was working with blast to, to build a better product and i did at times with blast and i did at times with esl um but but nothing to to a degree where it was like a day-to-day -day basis i just you know i was tired of being a mercenary i was tired of being like hey welcome this is the show you're going to run it's the same one we've been doing for the past four years um you know i didn't at the end like you don't even we didn't even need to go to rehearsal towards the end it's just like show up and turn the cameras on and we have everything memorized and that just kind of that just kind of got got boring uh, to a certain degree. So so no, I, I really liked you know and, and also going into like a team organization, even if it wasn't coaching, was kind of something that was interesting to me as well. Because again, it's like you're you're you are a little bit more part of a team, not just because it's like an organization running a team, but um, because they you know they have to they are a little bit more creative and they are a little bit more nimble than I think the big production you know, behemoths that like, like ESL that we work with that have so many different layers and so many different corporate entities to it and the blast as well. Although blast is pretty nimble too. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know. I, I just wanted to feel like I was working with a smaller tight knit crew to achieve some kind of a goal. And when you're a freelance commentator, you know, you don't really know, you don't really always have a goal anymore. You don't really always have something you're working towards outside of like a good show, but you don't even always have control of that. You're just kind of showing up cameras on, you do your part and then you leave and then that's it. And I just kind of wanted more out of it and wasn't finding it anywhere. All right. Uh, Prof, you got anything here on this topic or do you want us to, to move on? No, let's, let's move to, to Liquid because obviously that was a stress-free environment probably for you. No no issues there coming into <laughs> that for the first couple of months. Uh, what, was it, what was it like? Uh, obviously, your expectations were somewhere. Like, what, what were the expectations actually when you came into it? Did you think it's going to be like super hard? Was, was it super hard? uh yeah but like for for different different reasons that i that i kind of expected uh to a certain degree i mean i knew i knew it was going to be hard because i think the the big thing that i knew when i took this job is it wasn't necessarily a matter of um you know the counter-strike itself necessarily being an issue but i knew that we would have to kind of you know, with all the struggles that Liquid had over the years and, uh, you know, all the things I kind of knew from, you know, second or third hand through the players from chatting after events and at after parties and stuff. Um, I knew like the biggest obstacle to to the to coaching and to being in liquid was was the objective to change the the culture and the mentality, like fixing the problem of choking was, um, you know, fixing the problem of of just kind of falling falling apart and mentally, I think was was one thing that I kind of highlighted as my biggest goal. Um, still haven't achieved it yet, and that'll I think always just ends up always being a work in progress. Um, but you know that was kind of where I expected to go. It certainly wasn't stress free. I, I think the 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 hard part when I when I hopped in was I had this kind of mentality where it was like. Um, you know, started coaching during COVID times and everything's online. So it's like, all right, let's spend like these next like, you know, four or five months or six months, you know, while we're in COVID. And it's, you know, going to be an area where I'm not expected to, we're not expected to perform on like the big stages of Cologne. We're not expected to perform in Katowice. We have this online era where I get to kind of, 
you know, get caught up to speed on the counter strike and settle into this position and start figuring things out. We had Grim who had just joined right before I did. Um, you know, you, we have these months to get a new player involved in all the strategies and see how he likes to play and see where we can work him in and move him around if need be. Um, we've got this situation where we didn't, we didn't, we had, you know, Keith on the op. We didn't have like a natural opper, didn't have a natural in-game leader. Let's see how things are panning out and seeing where we need to take things and where they can go. Um, and I think that the hard part about that was, I think, even just the online era causing causing a certain amount of issues, like the small external problems um, involved in playing Counter-Strike online for what's over a year now, um, kind of caught me off guard a little bit when we initially started. So, I mean, I kind of went into it with the mindset of this is kind of going to be a ramp up period where everyone's kind of, you know, getting a little bit used to each other and working on some things. And then we'll be ready to take those big leaps and start running forward once once lands come back. And obviously. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I got one here just quickly, Jason. Now, yeah. obviously, when you joined the team, yeah, Grim was was a new addition. Um, would you have preferred to have jumped in when Nitro was still there? Uh, uh yeah, but only because only because you know Nitro had been around, and I and I, I liked Nitro, and I'd had some conversations with Nitro, and I mean, he actually shot me a message as well when I joined, and, and we both just kind of briefly talked and. We both just have a lot of respect for each other in terms of the Counter Strike and everything, and it would have just been nice to work with someone like Nitro. I think Nitro is a great guy. And listen, if if there's one thing that I learned very quickly um, within this team when I started coaching, it was how important Nitro was. You know, we always had the conversation on on analyst decks and and casting during matches um, <clears throat> about you know how sometimes he probably didn't get the credit he deserved as an in-game leader about how sometimes, you know, he was kind of like an overlooked player within the liquid roster, but he was, he was like the cohesive guy. He was the glue. Everyone on the team had some, some positive relationship with, with Nick in one way or the other. So when he left, I think a lot of, he was like that common piece holding, he was like, he's like the friend in the group that gets everyone together. You know, how like every group of friends has like one guy where if he's like, Hey, let's everyone get together. Everyone's going to congregate with that guy. That was, that was Nick. And when you lose that player within a team, um, I think things just start to fray naturally and things just kind of slowly get, get worse and worse. And um, that's kind of where things went, you know, after, after he departed. So he was a huge piece of the puzzle, a huge piece of that, of that grand slam run liquid. And obviously the first five years of liquid within counter-strike. So it would have just been nice to have worked with him because of all that. And because of, you know, the respect and the history I've been casting nitro since his career began began. So um, that would have been cool. Cool. Now uh, I want to go a little bit more current focus, right? Yeah. The, the, the twist, uh issue how how quick did that become prevalent to you that it, it was going to be a problem within the team or that there there was uh, some overlap here in, in how things were were being handled um pretty quick um yeah it was pretty fast and um you know some some things some things we worked on and got better and some things we um some things we worked on and, and they got worse um, and it just, just couldn't find a way to make it work. I do want to say with the, with the whole twist situation, um, I mean, you know, that was, that was one of those weird situations in teams where when I got in, I don't think, I don't think anyone was necessarily the, you know, the, the, the joke is who's the problem. And I don't think anyone was necessarily the problem. It just got to a point where I don't think it, it worked well enough in any way to to fix it you know the the op the option is you know spend months trying to fix this kind of problem or this kind of issue that's arising or just get rid of it um and it's not that he was the problem it's that everyone together combined was a, was a problem on some level like everyone on some way was preventing this you know this project from from working in any meaningful direction of being efficient and um that was that was one of the main reasons why um i decided to, to pull the trigger and and just get rid of your, you know, move Russ on. And I think it, it worked out well for him as well and bring someone else in. Um, and that just felt like the right thing to do at the time with the way things were going. Joel, but the, when you, when you came in, obviously you, you had that hurdle of you being uh, a coach for the first time, you're coming into an organization, you're <laughs> obviously bringing uh, all of that knowledge that you had from, from casting, watching games, but then you're having to integrate that in a live environment with the team that's going through roster changes and everything. And then the team by the end of the year still managed to have, I, I guess most people would say good results, right? The global challenge that that was a, a a pretty good result. Yeah, but I think it's it's pretty telling um, that our best result to end that year 
with that with that lineup came when we'd already already internally told the entire team what what the decision was that that Russ was going to be stepping out and that a new player was going to be coming in for the next year. Um, and I and I think when when your best result comes. Um, when that information is out among the team, like that, that's just a sign, you know, like. But NIP in Dubai is what you're saying. Yeah. Like, you know, the roster change is going to happen. So everything, everyone plays a little bit looser. Everyone kind of relaxes a little bit more. The problems that were there are, are no longer the focal point because everyone knows that there's a change coming. So it's just, you know, shut up and play. The conversation that we had after, after everyone was informed was, listen, this is happening. And yeah, it sucks in, in a lot of ways and wish it didn't have to be this way. But let's just focus on this one event and make sure that, you know, Russ has had a long, what, four year career in Team Liquid and he achieved a lot of historic things with that, with the Grand Slam. Let's make sure that his last event in a Team Liquid jersey um, is a positive one. And let's make sure that his, his send off is a positive one. Let's make his last memory here um, of going the distance into a tournament. And unfortunately, uh, we went the distance and ran straight into Australia. Us who got to just bend us over, <laughs> bend him over one last time as a parting gift. So good, good for them. I, I guess we could. Uh, no, actually, let's stay with this. We'll save the, these extra questions until Let we me, get later. Just one question, because uh, just curious about about it. Like, were these issues that you're talking about with Twist and the rest of the team? Was it more like an interpersonal thing or an in-game thing that that you couldn't solve, or you could solve only by by changing a player, right? Um. There were there were elements of both. Um, there was a lot. There was a lot of issues. Honestly, I don't want to go too deep into to this stuff with Russ, just because he had, like I said, he'd been here for four years, and I was here for the last like five months of it. Um, and I think a lot of the issues that that were kind of prevalent were things that came before my time, but I I can't even I don't even know the full history of them myself. Um, so I don't know. It's it's really not my place. But there there were elements of both in there, you know, in game and out of game stuff. And it just felt like, yeah, even if you fixed one, I think the other one was still going to be an issue. Uh, before we get to like the, the most recent stuff with uh, with Fallen, I wanted to, this has been kind of a theme with not just broadcast people, but just generally uh, among people who just get into coaching the first time with a lot of knowledge. And they kind of, they go into it thinking they have a lot of knowledge and that's kind of what is important in that job as a coach. But, you know, as time goes, they kind of realize that there's so much more that comes with it. So I wonder how like the early days were for you, like the early months, how you evolved as like with your understanding of the role. Um, yeah, I kind of fell into that trap too, but like in a weird roundabout way where I knew um I knew coming into it that that um I was gonna be more valuable on the outside of the counter strike stuff. Uh, more valuable in the things that didn't necessarily have to do with the, with the game itself, um, although it could still be of use there. But I did end up even even with that knowledge, I did end up focusing on on the Counter Strike probably a little bit too much early on, um, and I think a lot of it was because it's it's very it was very overwhelming for me. Like here's we talk about Counter Strike a lot on broadcasts and casting, and we talked about it a lot, Chad, behind the scenes in the green rooms and everything like that, and just at the bar and everything, but you know, players just talk about it in a different way. So I felt very overwhelmed with the amount of, first of all, watching the amount of like smokes and grenades and flashbangs that these guys all have memorized, like even just like just tons more than just even the standard stuff that you could go into, but also their conversations about the game are frequently, it's almost like listening to a different language because they're, they're about like strategies and setups that they've been running for like four years. So it's it's like oh they're just running this setup they're they're running like you know the 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 very games 2014 setup and they're running like this and it, like when the when the conversation is happening and and I don't know what they're even considering the very games 2014 setup not not to mention even as a caster you don't necessarily even um you don't always like you don't always dive deep into like the, the different setups and why they're being used. So it just, it just felt like the conversations that were occurring, I had a lot of catching up to like, I had to learn what these setups are, what this smoke is, all the different names for them, all the different strategies they run, all, all the, all the vastly different things. So I was, I was overwhelmed and intimidated by that kind of knowledge um, that I didn't have the same way as the players that had been playing together for two, three, four years. Um, and that's why I think I, that's part of the reason why I think I ended up focusing too much on CS or a little early on. Okay. Uh, let's let's move it forward now into the more recent movements that have been happening now. Obviously, for those people unawares, uh, Fallen joined the team uh, and since has taken over as in-game leader, right? That wasn't the intention off the bat. You were going to leave Stewie in, in that position. Uh, but 
that wasn't the case and this change has come through and and since Fawn's taken over you guys have had a mixed bag of results sometimes it looks great sometimes it looks meh um when when making this change why why would well i don't i, I guess we all know why Fawn's a legendary player a legendary in-game leader somebody who back in the, the 2016s you know was one of the best players in the world um but it, the from the beginning, it was Fallen's not going to be in-game leading, and now Fallen is in-game leading. What what was the the switch that happened here? It obviously has to be to do with Stewie, right? Uh, yeah, that conversation actually just very much occurred um, pretty quickly after. I mean, look, we I think that that change occurred like the the day that we got beat by Phase a second time in Blast. Um, and I think I think when you when you cut a player like like Russ, or when you sorry, when when player like Russ moves on, the player that you just switched out in your team comes back with his new team and just kind of spanks you twice in a, in one weekend. I think you naturally have like a little bit of a come to Jesus moment, and you kind of reassess everything. And if it's working the way you want it to, if it's as efficient and effective as as you want it to be, um, and we kind of had that talk, and, and the answer was was no, um, and we decided to make that switch. Um, it wasn't necessarily wasn't necessarily the, the plan wasn't always to have fallen become the in-game leader I, you know i think i think stewie reads the game very well i think stewie can be an, an, a great in-game leader if if he ever chooses to be um some things he's got to some things he's got to pick up on which i think was part of the cool reason of of getting fallen i think the 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 attractiveness is of fallen as a player to pick up wasn't just you know him being an opera and in-game in -game leader but it, it's just a lot of a lot of flexibility um, like we knew we could move him into the in-game leader spot if we if we needed to. We knew he would be very supportive. Um, you know, I, I I knew he could help Stewie advance in different areas of in-game leading and leadership that he probably didn't have a great role model at some point during his career to help him kind of improve in those regards. Um, and this was just one of the flexibilities that that he provided us. And um, I think he felt good after about three weeks or so of being in Europe of understanding well enough how we played and the tactics that we run um, to be able to pick that up and step in and, and lead us pretty quickly um so that was that was a pretty impressive thing to have happen so i mean it's still going to be a work in progress obviously but yeah that was that was a conversation that we just came to pretty quick after getting our getting our ass kicked one weekend all right and i suppose if we look more into the picking up of fallen right now mm -hmm. something which is uh easy to understand or easy to empathize with or maybe easy to make as a story which is what i I'm, tend to be good at is looking at the fallen situation somebody who uh you know had to have a lot of drive to get where he was as a professional player then continue that through and expanded on what he had created right he made himself um the the game yeah. academy stuff and, and and built an empire right and has a lot on his plate whereas you know you wake up every day you got the coaching stuff maybe a couple of other bits and pieces going on the same with most people we woke up we have one main focus and then all these other ones it feels like fallen has a shitload going on was that ever a point of conversation when you were, were talking to me like, hey, dude, are you like, like, how do, how do we know that you're fully committed to this? How do we know that you're not blinded by all this other shit that's going on? Was that ever a, a conversation? Yeah, uh, that was the first thing I spoke to him about when, uh, when I reached out to him. Um, I think that might have actually been the first line after, hey, how's it going? <laughs> um, it, no, because those, those concerns are fair and those concerns are valid. And, and I remember even having those concerns and speaking about them on broadcasts in the past. So um, it very much was like, look, man, are you looking to compete? Are you looking to kind of, you know, end somewhere into your career playing with friends and just having a good time? and Do a dignitas. Um, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Um, but yeah. So that that was basically I just asked him like what's up like what are you looking for here are you looking to are you still trying to win trophies are you still trying to win championships are you still trying to be the best um and and yeah his his I mean the kind of conversation we have was was that he was focused on um cementing his cementing his legacy um you know cementing his his legacy as a player and his kind of history as a player as one of the best and as one of the best offers and in-game leaders and and finding himself another major um and you know that that kind of was obviously perfect for me i want i want guys who are going to chase down a legacy i want guys who are going to feel um the importance of of history of their position in counter-strike history and um for me that's that's the best thing you can you can play for um so i was i was pleased with that answer and um he hasn't he hasn't disappointed yet you know, yeah. there's that there's been no distraction. He does have a lot of stuff going on, but he's also got um, a great, great team back in Brazil around him um, that helps with a lot of those different things. So he's never he's never once slipped up in any responsibility to the team. Um, so, yeah, we've I think everyone from the top of the organization to the bottom of the organization um, has been so pleased with Fallen. Um, 
and I know he's he's gotten some he's gotten some shade and some shit, you know, publicly for for some things. But you know, we've looked at him and just said this is this has been incredible. I think he's one of the best best teammates I think I've ever ever seen. To be quite honest with you, he's been phenomenal. Cool. All right. Well, that's good news on that one, right there, boys. Do we want to jump in about the boot camp, or do you have anything more about Fallen or, or this in-game leader situation specifically? I think my question about Fallen is because we talked about it on the show almost every week, essentially. Because yep. we, <laughs> at this I, point, new narrative <laughs> with Fallen and, and Liquid as well. It's like you're winning everything, you're losing everything. But <laughs> when you brought him in, it was of course you're replacing Twists, and we all know Twists is a pretty good player, and you, you're bring in someone else and that is fallen who seemed and it still seems a, a bit of a risk right you, you don't know where he is form wise at least for liquid who wants to be number one in the world and win a major and all of that in, in that kind of terms you don't know where his form is is, is he's going to be good enough uh so was that the like the first option you went for and like did you really want someone specifically who had a lot of experience because you have grim on the team as well who's kind of new to, to this was that kind of the thinking um so well i mean the first thing i'll say is we, i don't think i don't think we would have let you know I, I probably wouldn't have wanted um to to allow russ to move on the way that all went down if if we didn't have mike uh grim he's obviously got a lot of things to learn and a lot of room to grow but i mean what he showed us in december in terms of his his mechanics and his fragging ability and his ability to anchor bomb sets we were super pleased with with what he showed and, and extremely happy with how good that he he turned out to be just right out of the gates um and then that gave us a lot of confidence um to be able to say you know here's a player who you know we can switch into some of russ's positions when we when we find our opera and our new player someone who can kind of deliver on that front um so that's one angle of it um with fallen again understand the understand the concerns around his individual level i honest to god wasn't wasn't super worried about it um i had a, i had a bit of bit more faith that he'd be able to kind of bounce back i my, my take on fallen at the time was that um, he was in the same situation with MIBR and that Brazilian core that we were in with Liquid, where regardless of like who you want to point the finger at and say this is this guy's wrong and this guy's right or this guy's doing poorly or this guy's the problem, something within that core just didn't really work anymore. Something within that Brazilian team just was it was not functional and it was causing individual players to struggle in a way that they that they shouldn't be, that they have too much talent to be. And it was the same thing with us. We had so many, so many problems, you know, as as a team that we were trying to overcome that everyone's individual level was dropping. So I had some confidence that if we got him, if we got him out of out of that core and onto our team, he'd be able to snap back. I think, you know, Jake and Jake and John or Stewie and Elise have done a great job working with him to to kind of help him get, you know, updated a little bit on, on current you know um you know peaks he can take options he has in different situations different angles he can hold different setups he can fall into so it, it's it's really just kind of been a team effort of kind of getting him up to speed on some certain things but his individual levels um you know i think i think it rises and falls with how good of a team environment and how good of uh, we're playing matches as a team like when he's playing well our team is communicating very well when he's playing poorly um our team can do better at, at picking up communication and picking up you know the the back and forths I guess just on this as well, without you, right? Like when, when Russ was there and you were there, I look at this and I go, the heart of this team is Jason, right? Not because like, obviously you one of the newer members to the team, but I don't look at Stewie like somebody who can carry like positive attitude all the time as a, as, as an in-game leader or as a, you know, as the cheerleader for the team. Uh, Elish, he, he seems like a very smart guy, but same thing. looks like lots of focus. Naf, uh, the sloth people call him, right? You're not looking at him to be the guy hyping everybody up. Um, do you think that's what Fallen brings as well here? I know this is almost is something that's very difficult to be tangible, but looking at the team, otherwise you got a, a bunch of guys who look like they just smell a pretty bad fart, right? Like while they're playing. And then you have Fallen, who's somebody who, who's, a, who's a leader. Is, do you think the team was lacking that as well? Because watching Stewie on some of these cams in the recent events, even when he wasn't leading, he looked like he was fucking out of it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing, I mean, Fallen's not like kind of, we haven't really gotten to that point as a team yet where I think we can get like really, really fucking hype and like ride emotions throughout an entire match. Um, we, we have had some good ones. Um, but, but yeah, I think the thing that Fallen brings that, that we didn't have was, um, he's another guy like myself, who's just, you know, eternally focused on the positive. Like once, once the match hits, 
it's it's you know the one of the big changes that we're trying to make and bring in and it's going to take a lot of time is you know once the match hits you're in, you're in match mode and there's no more there's no more bitching there's no more complaining there's no more getting upset about things it's everything's positive um and it is one of the things that i keep preaching to the guy pretty much every day of practice that makes me feel like an idiot um but it's true is that you know liquid as a team has all the intelligence and all the game knowledge and all the skill and ability to overcome any obstacle that's placed in front of them the only reason that we ever stop ourselves from overcoming those obstacles are when we shut down in terms of communication, in terms of mentality, in terms of emotion. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we're working on shifting that around, but you know, changing changing that emotional state of, of a team or or anyone is not an overnight process. Um, and it's one of those things that's you know that's why I constantly bring it up is because it's constantly got to be one of the priorities that we have going into matches. Um, and I, and I think a lot of it has to do with as well. Sometimes these things. I don't know if you ever felt the same way as a player, Chad. I always there were there were times where I felt like, um, like it, sometimes it feels like nothing's working until one day it does. Until like one day you step into a match server and all five of those things that you've been practicing for the past two weeks that everyone had been struggling with and still making mistakes, all of a sudden it it, it clicks it clicks into a match and then and then that's when you can start building up some confidence and that's when you can start having a little bit more fun and that's when you start building trust in each other and that's when you start to kind of gel as a team and that's when you can shrug off someone missing a smoke here and there. That's when you can shrug off somebody missing a flashbang here or there. That's where you can shrug off someone someone making a mistake that gets you killed um and so that's that's kind of that's kind of the state that we're that we're trying to get to right now game in game out um and some games we have it and some games we don't and we just need to make that more of a consistent thing okay uh let's pivot this now because bloody hell we can really chew through two hours can't I'm we a, already i'm a talker i no, I bring, it's not those, you. bring those skills from commentary into this <laughs> There's lots of interesting stuff here, Jason. That's all. So we're, we're 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 getting stuck in for a little bit longer than what we normally would on the hot seat. But let's pivot now to the boot camp because you guys just spent a decent chunk of time in Europe, and we're going to talk more about what that means uh, later in the show. So this is more about uh, when we focus in on this. When you come over for a boot camp like this, did you already know the start date and the end date of when you're rocking out the tournaments you were playing and when you were leaving, or is this more of a fluid situation that, that because of the COVID? The COVID. What am I, ninety-year-old man? Jesus. I like that. That was good. Um, this particular one, we had a pretty, pretty good idea. Uh, no, we knew the dates when we when we left. We knew what date we'd be coming back. Um, I can't, I can't speak to other, other, other teams to be quite honest with you in terms of some of the teams that are over there and boot camping. I think. Well, there's, there's a couple of things. We knew the days that we would be coming and the days that we would be leaving. But you know, COVID offers some, some unique challenges to our team. Um, for instance, you know, Fallen has to renew his Brazilian visa every time he goes goes out. They've all they've had to do that throughout their whole career. Um, but the difference is it's a it's a little bit it's a little bit different now with COVID, obviously, because that particular visa I, I don't know the exact details of it can only get renewed at one one specific consulate that's still open to do that particular visa, um, which which makes it tough. And and also, I mean, it's one of those situations where sometimes it's hard to travel to that location depending on where you are. Um, and also that visa, I think, takes like a week to get back once you once you turn in all the paperwork and do the interview. So you don't just get it that day and then you can leave. Um, so Fallen's actually still in Europe right now while the rest of us came back on the first. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's, there's other things that just change. So sometimes you just don't know, like, um, I think while we were in Europe, everything was, was cool when we left. And then it came down that Canada requires its citizens when they come back, um, to quarantine in a hotel for like up to 10 days. So is Nap in a hotel right now? Uh, I think so. Oh, blood deep. So does he have a PC? That's a really good question. Jesus. Um, but but like those those are the challenges that that can pop up and <laughs> that we just don't know about. So okay. yeah, we know we know which day we're coming home from the boot camp yeah. and and we generally know which day we're going to go back to the next boot camp. Um but I mean there's just a bunch of obstacles that can just pop up randomly at any one moment. So from what you've just said, practice at the moment is fucked. Well, I mean, listen, we just spent six weeks doing 12 plus hours a day sure. of carrying a Counter-Strike. So when we got home, it was nobody <laughs> worried about practice for the next week. You know, everyone takes some time off. Cool. Sure. It's probably harder to deal with the jet lag now that you're traveling less, right? Your body's less acclimatized to that as well? Uh, Yeah, I mean, jet lag's not too big of an issue. I'll tell you what's the weirdest The weirdest thing is when we're at this boot camp, I, this is this is one of the harder things to kind of deal with is, you know, you're going to a boot camp and we have a, we have a great facility provided by, by Liquid and Alienware. Um, but, you know, it is still, as Chad would say, the COVID times. Um, so 
you know, the, the city is shut down, you know, everything is still kind of in quarantine everything is still kind of shut down. There's a curfew, blah, blah, blah. So it's weird when we are there and we have like this really rough two week stretch of like really long practices. Everyone's been working hard and it's like, take two days off. And it's almost like the days off are more work than the practice days. Cause it's like, Oh great. I have a day off. Should I stay in my apartment and play video games on my, on my PC here? Or should I go down to the facility and play video games on my PC down in the, in the gaming room? And those are, those, those are the two options. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fuck. That's... So that, that's a weird Ugh. one. Cause like I've, I've had times where I can tell we're getting to the point where everyone kind of needs a break and needs some time away from counter-strike, even if it's just for a day, but then you kind of kind of give a day off. And I, I even had a player like, you know, tell me at one point, like, I'd rather just scrim today than have this day off. And it was like, yeah, I, I don't really know how to handle this one. Yeah, that's something I will, I will with first-hand accounts dive into later when we talk about the whole North Amer American thing. But I can, I can, I've been there in that exact environment. Uh, Prof, we've got you, right? Striker, you're back too? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. We fixed the tech issues. It's not a Hadro TV confirmed that tech issues. Had connection problems like forever now. We'll, we'll get someone. Well, Lucas can fix the internet too. Prof, you got anything to do with the boot camp? Yeah, good at that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he might still be at rehearsal mate um do we have do we have anything else regarding the the boot camp and the recent results prof i guess we can just like uh i think at one point you said something like that you need some like good results to get the the team to like band together and stuff like that uh i guess like the katowice group stage was pretty good like the the, the does that set you on the right course as liquid uh even though the playoff game didn't really go that well yeah, I think so. I mean, we, we yeah, we had a we had a really good group stage um, in terms of taking down Vitality, taking down Navi again, which was which was nice. Um, some solid wins over OG. Um, yeah, we were we were pleased with that, and I mean that's that's stuff we have to build on. Again, I mean we're still in that kind of phase too, where it's like you know even the games, even you know you you take the good out of the games that you win, and and you and you fix the bad, and you work on the bad. So nothing set in stone. Um, it's just a matter of that. That kind of shows us how good we can be it shows us kind of where we can get to and, and where we strive why we strive to have that consistency because you know if we play if we played against vp the way we played against navi i think we at least would have had a way better chance of winning that series in the semifinals and making it into the finals and and that's that's i think is the, the tough part to hit is you know every match has to be you know the focus and the mentality throughout the entire thing is, is what we had at that Navi game, uh, and we didn't have it against VP. Um, part of that is probably on me uh, trying to find different ways to to organize and structure match days so that we can be at the right place mentally. Um, and part of that is is on us as a team of, of, of figuring out ways to kind of work together to hype each other up and get each other in the right place. Um, so I mean, you know, we're we're trying to fix a lot of these things and we're coming up with different ideas and not all of them are going to land. But the results, the good results that we have, are are like little guiding stars that we have to kind of keep track of and, and keep working at it. Uh, one cool. thing that I wanted to ask about is um, when I saw that you guys are actually playing. I don't know if you guys accidentally discussed this while I was gone, but. Um, you're playing in DreamHack Open March, which obviously, you know, you're in North America, you might as well, but it just generally seemed to me like you're almost doing that only for the benefit of North American CS and like trying to help out the, the, the little man, you know, and stuff like that. Is that the case or do you, are you just doing it to get more confidence, you know, against like some of the lower tier teams in, in NA or why, why did you end up uh, playing in a tournament that, you know, seems like below your level? Um... Oh. There's no, there's there's some reasons I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I can really speak to all the reasons at the moment. Um, but I know one of the one. Of, I mean, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of truth in that. It's one of the one of the conversations, uh, ongoing conversations that we're having with you know the different tos like Blast and DreamHack and and ESL um, is that essentially, you know we we need to have like it's all well and good that like all that we have all these events in europe and every single event in europe but at some point we need we need to be here like at some point we need to be able to play in these tournaments in north america um at some point we need to be here to practice against these teams you know we're we're the we're the closest thing they have to like you know top professional european counter-strike and we need to be here to play against these squads and give them that experience and we need to be the here for some tournaments every once in a while now and again um to to be able to play bring that style into a match environment for some of these teams we need to be here to bring the eyeballs to these tournaments so that there's there's more opportunities for 
for TOs that want to run NA events for, for marketing. And I can bring numbers to sell on it, to put more money involved in the scene on a local level. Um, we need to do it to bring eyeballs to show that there's some talent that's still in the North American region that might want to get put, uh, you know, picked up that, that, that shows good things in some of these events. Um, so, I mean, it's it's not all going to work, and, and we have a lot of obligations pulling us in a lot of different directions at the moment, but I know one of the things that, you know, we, we've kind of been highlighting to everyone when we have the conversations about the schedule is we, ha we have to be in NA at a certain point. We have to be involved in the scene at a certain point. A team of our stature, um, you know, as one of the few NA teams left on the professional level, needs to be playing in the NA region and NA scene from time to time. Like, we, we have to. Or else, you know, this scene is just going to keep getting worse. So, um, there, there's there's a bunch of different reasons we're playing in this Dreamhack Open. Um, that's that's one of them. Okay. All right. Uh, I I suppose what we'll do now is we have the goals for you and Team Liquid in 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 2021. Don't you dare say win the major. Why not? Well, because win the major is not going to happen. What are we still all crazy and we think the world's going to fix itself in a couple of months? I no think one. the major is going to happen. Oh, I think, Jason. I think the major is going to happen, and I'm going to win that son of a bitch. Okay. Yeah, and you're going to come back stronger, and you're going to. Wait, wait, wait. I've never said that. I've never said that. Don't put that phrase in my mouth until I bust that back. Give me some realistic Twitter. goals. <laughs> Why no, is winning I'm the major saying, not a realistic okay, goal? Okay, let me try again. Let, give, me some, give me some goals that don't include the major. Okay. Win well, <laughs> I'd like to win DreamHack Open March. Okay, there we go. Seems like a realistic goal for sure. Um, uh, we're falling on 150 ping. I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, Jason might get to play. Yeah, you might never know. Up. Don't don't count your chickens before they hatch. And you maybe, can get lead. Look, if you want to like develop a North American team, maybe you can get a stand in some like up and coming Ooh. golfer. Give him some experience and liquid. Give him a liquid jersey to hang on the wall. It was, it was that was an option that we discussed. Um, didn't go with it, to be honest with you, uh, for a couple of reasons. It's it's not it's not anything crazy. We we talked about briefly. Uh, actually, that's not even. I don't even know if that would be an issue. So let's not even bring it up. But we did we did have conversations about finding like an NA player that would just be able to step in if we needed him to, depending on the ping. But also because we didn't know um, Keith's situation with the hotel quarantine. So. You know, ah. there's there's a couple of things. So we, we had it as an option and something that we've that we've looked at and talked about. Um, realistic goals for 2020. Well, I mean, honestly, the the I think the the hard part about this team is at a certain extent on on if you're if you're part of Team Liquid, you know, even if we're at, or struggling as much as we have at times over the past few months, um, the expectations and the goals are still to win. You know, we have a Liege who who's probably what like a I would you know top five this, this is going to cause I guess a fucking issue because it's HLTV and you guys did your your top twenty, but he's probably a pop, top five player in the world. Um, you know, we've got Fallen who's got an incredible history, um, has won two majors. We've got Stewie who's won a major in a grand slam. Um, you know, we've got Naf who's, who's an incredible player as well. Who's also won the grand slam. We, we have, we have the expectations to win, to win events. So when you talk about goals, um, it's not like, you know, we haven't sat down and never been like, we have to win this event or, or this is just, what are we doing here? Um, but you know, Cologne is obviously a big goal of mine. I want to do well at that this year, especially if it's going to be on LAN. Pro League is a huge deal for us. We want to make sure that we're doing good at Pro League. Um, an easy one right now with it coming up is uh, we have the Blast Showdown right after Pro League. We'd obviously like to obviously like to qualify through that, especially considering how difficult that's going to be with Vitality down there, with Astralis down there, and I don't know, five other extremely difficult teams that I can't even think of at the moment off the top of my head. So, yeah, we'd like to qualify for the main uh, the main, uh, the, the main, fi finals uh, with spring finals for Blast. We'd like to do really, really well at Pro League. We'd like to win it. We'd like to get top four at the very least. Um, I think I think realistically, getting top four at every event is kind of the goal. And, and I mean, winning winning is obviously the goal, but, you know, that's obvious. That's kind of been taken away from me. So let's just say top four at every event we go to. I wasn't trying to take it away from you, Jason. I just, like, I just, I just find <laughs> I get it, it so Every hard team to says, fathom yeah. a major happening this year, right? It's like, yeah. I think the major is going to happen this year. Well, look, I mean, look at how close we, because because the major is obviously not going to happen with a crowd. Uh, I think are they planning for the Dota major to have a crowd? Okay, well, same place? I, see, I think the major is going to happen. I just don't think there's going to be a crowd. Okay, well, all right, but that, it's Sweden, so you never know. They do whatever the fuck they want in Sweden. 
All right, I think we'll wrap the hot seat here and we'll get into general chit chat now and we'll dive back into some more Moses and NA related stuff a little bit further down the track. So Lucas, roll the bumper. Let's get into the recent news. Hi, welcome back. Thank you for sitting through the bumper and the adverts. We're going to get underway with the recent news. And uh, before we get into any of our predetermined topics, uh, OG lost to Bubble, Dreamer, Victor, those guys. You may remember them from about five years ago. So that happened. Anyway, you can all check out the demo. Let's talk about the things that we have prepared for today's show. Uh, one of them would be Obo getting his return to a competitive environment. Now, if you don't remember, late slash middle-ish of last year, Obo had had enough of being away from home. It's going to be a common theme of this evening, I think. Um, and he left Complexity, went back to the States. Uh, in more recent times, said that he wanted to compete, didn't matter where, Europe, North America, whatever. Uh, EG obviously had an opening. Ethan went to Valorant. I think that's how they're pronouncing it these days. And uh, he able to pick up that slot. So the team now, for those people playing at home, standing game leading, we've got Tarek in the mix as well, Breeze, Cirque, and old boy Obo coming in as the fifth with Zeus as the coach. Now, straight off the bat here, uh, we may as well kick this one straight over to you, Jason. You look at this roster as the other North American powerhouse, do you think they're going to be a threat with this roster? Uh, yeah. Okay. I th yeah, I think they should be. Um, I think I think Obo is going to turn out to be. I mean, listen, I think everyone who's played with Obo, even even the complexity guys, who I think maybe that felt like that kind of soured when he left a little bit, probably probably talk about his skills um, and how good he was as a player. He's someone that 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 we've kind of talked about as well. That I've had that I've had an eye on in case we needed something else or if if we ever needed a player. Um, but yeah, I mean, this team, again, this team is is like us. They have a lot of players with good pedigree, good skills. Uh, Cirque's incredible opera. Breeze is incredible as a player. Like, there's there's so much talent on this team. And I think they too, obviously, with Ethan departing right now, they've obviously been going through some, their own internal stuff. I feel like they're where we were probably in December of last year, November of last year, where okay. they're going through their, like, internal demons at the moment. And it's obvious when I watch them play that there's players that just aren't living up to their potential at the moment. Um, and I don't necessarily, as far as I know, there's not a good excuse outside of, again, what I mentioned earlier, where I think they just have some, some team issues that's preventing everyone from playing well, playing every, it's preventing everyone from getting comfortable within this team. Um, but I think they're too good to keep down, especially when you add someone like Obo, he's, he's going to be good. All right. Uh, Prof, when you look at this team, do you think this is enough to get them back to obviously not the IEM New York level of the team when they were beating Astralis, but a version of the team that is relatively competitive within the top 10? Do you think this was enough to get them there? Or do you think they should be more aggressive with roster changes? What What do you think? Like this would have to like inspire some internal change as Moses is talking about. And I'm not sure that Obo is capable of that. Like he's just like a 17 year old kid in the end. Like he can play well. But I don't think playing well was like Ethan's issue there. And I doubt that Ethan was a guy that was causing all of the issues on the team. So it's not like just removing him and not bringing in someone like, let's say, what Fallen brought to Liquid as someone with a lot of experience, drive and stuff like that is going to be like some massive change uh, in that team. Like, yeah. Okay. Okay. But, do you, but like, let's troubleshoot this, right? Because we can only theorize in which way we think this is going to go. It's obvious that Obo is a good player. So going into Ethan's shoes, that's almost one for one. What What do you think the issue is with EG then? Because they they seem to think it's it's not with the coaching leadership situation. Uh, they made that clear after that ESL piece that that went out, which um, the, the, was the people who weren't happy with that. Stan was one of them. I I wrote that piece just for everybody playing at home. Um, that was focused on Zeus. Uh, the ESL team just decided to name it something about EG on YouTube. Uh, and literally, factually correct all of it, I will continue to add here, uh, based off of Twitlongers written by all individuals involved. And if they want to sit there and call it conjecture, that's fine. But the fact that they come out and want to want to fucking tweet about it shows that maybe I hit a little bit of a sore point there. Um, so now that I've gone on my tangent and rant here, Prof, 
Um, what, do, what do you think is the issue with EG? I mean, just, just to clarify, like uh, they could be around the top 10 team, like maybe number eight at some point, maybe number 12 at some point, but I don't think it's going to be like much more than that. At the moment, like Cirque isn't playing well, hasn't been playing well for some time. Because he wants to live in Europe. I mean, he is living in Europe now, so mm. whatever. He's True. in Serbia, Bulgaria, that's like pretty close anyway, so shouldn't be like a massive... I mean, it's literally next country, next one, one to each other. So yeah. should be like decent for him, at least like compared to like the culture of Serbia versus Bulgaria and then the United States. I'm pretty sure that it's like more close to home. But is Bulgaria nice? I've always wanted to go to Bulgaria. I've never been there. So okay. Can't say. <laughs> I think it's like a cheaper Serbia. I've, maybe. Never, I've never been there either. I know that they got the what, what red, white, and green on the flag. Yes. Nope. Yeah. See, so we nailed it. Yeah, Weird. I've been looking at going to Sofia for a while. I want to go on a little camping trip there. They got they got the mountains. I think they have a lot of mountains. They I got think that like strong strong suit. Somewhere. They have a they have like a monastery it. hidden within a mountain range, and I want to go. I want to go find that thing. Sounds Hire awesome. a guide, and go for that thing. Sounds Sorry, like monk stuff, monk stuff for sure. <laughs> when, whenever sick. whenever anyone talks about Bulgaria, I think I've spoken to Sirk about this like six times at different after parties. He's probably annoyed <laughs> me. <laughs> whenever someone brings up Bulgaria, I'm like, I want to go on a camping trip there. Tell me about Bulgaria. I hope they have all the information. Now I'm lost, Prof. Where were we going? I don't know. Like I think that was one of the issues. Obviously, you have Stan and Tarek. Uh, that also hasn't been going too well individually yeah. for them or even like the calling at some points or the map pool or like everything almost at different points so i don't know i mean like, the way it... save us striker. do you wanted to say something save us striker the way i see this is that you know it's always like a, a big cliche to say you know that this is going to re reinvigorate the team like there's going to be some fresh block coming in and stuff like that but i truly believe that this is going to be the case for two reasons one of okay. them being that EG have been in the same lineup for for such a long time. Like this, this is a, this is a lineup that stuck together for early 2019. Yeah, something like that when uh, when Dams got the boot. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, nice. that's uh, Montpellier. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that was the first like EPL Montpellier or something like that around yeah. around that time for sure. So that's like two years that this team has stayed untouched, which is a really long a time, long time, in, yeah. In uh, in in the CS terms for sure. Uh, and so, like, to have somebody new coming in is definitely going to help. Just, you know, having, like, maybe a few positions changing, like, somebody, like, really young with, I would imagine, a lot of drive after. I think he realized, Obo realized that he, he fucked up a little bit with uh, with leaving complexity the way that he did. I'm, I'm just, this is just uh, my opinion, obviously. I don't have anything to back this with. Uh, but I would imagine after he said that he's actually pretty okay with staying in Europe for, for longer periods of time, then maybe he realized that the... Um, wasn't such a good idea to leave complexity with that in mind. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, that's, 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 that's my that's that's my thought, take on it as well. I could I could be very wrong on this, but I thought his issue when he was in complexity wasn't wasn't being in Europe for long periods of time. It was being in Europe for long periods of time with the uncertainty of COVID. Like he was there when everything was just really breaking out, and there was a lot of a lot of shit swirling that nobody really knew. I think one of the things that he pointed out is not that they were in Europe, but there, there was no attention to ever come back to North America, right? right. He joined okay. the North American team and it just became a European team after a couple of like roster changes, right? He so was the only one left, right? It's just the... Rush. Yeah. Rush is still there, but I guess he's like 10 years older. So it's kind of different for him compared to, compared to Obo. But like one thing about EG as well, like I, I even think that their ranking right now is kind of inflated, like literally went through since November, like the they, 13th, they, they had like, the just like had one best of three win every month, literally. And then, or th then they had this blast group where they beat Vitality and G2, and that kind of boosted them up. But they really did not do anything. Like I am Beijing, lost to Chaos. We remember that. Yep. Then Global Final, they beat Furia, lost to Astralis and Liquid. Then they beat Funk Plus Phoenix. Uh, at DreamHack Open, lose to Big, lose to Funplex Phoenix. Then there's the Blast group where they lose to Complexity at the end, uh, so they finish second, uh, beat Vitality in G2, and then they beat Gambit, lose to Astralis in G2. So it's like, what are these results even? Like, th this is not convincing in any in any way, shape, or form, right? Especially considering, like, the 
obviously the owners of eg came out and said no we're, we're never considering dropping the team or selling the team or whatever i heard contrary to that that's fine um but it, especially if you were one of those players and you knew that you might be on the chopping block or that eg might not be looking to support counter-strike anymore you'd think that like at least winning in north america or coming top two against liquid or fury or whoever it was going to be that week w- would have been the priority right and i this is the thing with with eg and i've said this three times i'll say it again once we get into the conversation more about north america this is going to be like the main focal point of this but there's definitely conflicts within all these teams when you have people who are who are from certain parts of the world and you have people from other parts of the world and everybody has different priorities at different points in their life like when do i want to settle down when do i want to spend more time more home at time uh, time at home some people value family more like for me for example i haven't seen my family now in a whole year uh, more than that like so obviously i don't value family that highly which sounds heartless i value counter-strike more highly right i think there's a lot of that shit that's been happening within eg as well because it's clear if you look at some of them that some of them are really into other life stuff some of them are really just gaming all the time and streaming and some of them are you know off playing other games too but whatever like you've got everybody on different pages at different times. And I think that's what EG's problem is, getting everybody to focus with the same goal. Um, anyway, I finally said the right thing that I was looking for there. Uh, do we have anything else on EG or we keep this one moving? Keep it moving. Thank you. All right, yeah. cool. Yeah. Let's keep I could tell you you didn't want anything else on that subject. I just let, I just let you take it away. I, I, just, I want to get stuck in yeah. really, really badly when we get there. It's going to, and I'm running out of minutes. Um, all right, what do we got here? Heroic. No, wait, G2. Don't forget G2. Holy moly, red beans, ravioli, a trace on a Saranthus classic there for everybody. G2, did they even bench him? Isn't Kenny just gone? I thought he's Kenny's gone. gone. Kenny's he's gone, pretty gone. Much, He's pretty much gone, yeah. I yeah, mean, they he, benched he, him. He's still like a contracted to G2. Uh, but, you know, they're basically, look. he's looking for a different team. Okay. So he is pretty much out. Okay, so let's let's go with let's go with the fact that maybe in a blue moon he might get a chance to return, but pretty much on the on the way out. And that right there in itself, losing one of the most legendary orpers in the game. Uh, but him being replaced with Jax. Prof, what are you making of this? I hope it's temporary. Literally two weeks ago we had Nexa on the show saying mm-hmm. that Jax's English has has not improved during the time he was on the team. And since he was benched, he was playing with French people. It wasn't like he's playing international mixes trying to improve his English. I don't think he really expected to to get back on the team. So that doesn't sound great to me. And also just like Nico suddenly opting, like obviously he can't op, but you don't want him opting. Like he's he's the best hybrid, like the best hybrid player we have right now. Mm. I think that's that's a fair assumption to say. Maybe pure rifler, you can talk about Rops, you can talk about the Liege, but like someone that doesn't primarily op, and doesn't Talk about Irish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if he picks up the op, he can go into that as well. Like he's probably gonna boost his rating because the op is uh OP. Anyway, I'm actually so. surprised the leash is one isn't one of those people because he seems very adaptable. So I'm not sure that uh yeah, he just wants to that play. Out. He just wants to play hard mode. I feel like. I think I think Elish probably could op if he wanted to, but I think he would have to take a lot of fights within the team to get permission <laughs> to be a full time opper. I'm not he's saying full time. Dewey and Nap. A lot of these massive stars are just so good at the game that they can just pick up anything, you know. And Elise definitely seems like the type. Yeah, Elise is a bit of a bit of a freak when it comes to Counter Strike. He's he's very very good, obviously. Um, I I'm just laughing because I I've man we've been there. Like it sucks having <laughs> such role confusion around an opera. It like that, that's that's the most painful one because. Yeah, I, riflers can do it, and some riflers have been able to pick it up and do well. But obviously, like being an opera is much more than just like hitting the op shots, right? Like you know, you have to, like your positioning is huge. Um, how you're using your utility for your teammates is huge. Um, you know where you're cutting off the map. Like when do you get aggressive as the opera and get into a more combative stance? When do you just kind of hold an angle and let your team like move up and support them? So I think there's a lot of things that go into oping that I think. If a rifle for a rifler to pick it up, if they're not considering all of those different things, um, it can be really hard to kind of have the impact that you believe you're going to have with the AWP. It's much more than just like hitting some nice shots. Like we just saw someone. I mean, we just saw automatic. Like like the last like what year of his career was him trying to be an opera, and he was one of before he switched into opping. It was. He was a great rifler, incredibly intelligent player, super impactful, very very smart. And you put him on the op, and you just watched his his impact diminish. Um, I don't know this, this change for G2 to to get back on topic. Um, obviously it sucks seeing someone like Kenny S kind of get bounced off of a team 
Um, it, it doesn't necessarily surprise me, not due to any performance thing, but I think obviously when when you bring um, when you bring Nico in to have like Hunter and Nexa, that becomes kind of the heartbeat of the team, right? That that's now the core. That's the you, you got to sure. be very careful with roster changes in that sense because when you bring someone in who's as good as Nico um, and you bring him in with the people he's already kind of close with that's naturally just going to become kind of the, the guiding core of the team. But more than anything, I just, I want Nico to stop picking other shit up. Can he just be <laughs> the best fucking player he can be? Can we just like first see, I like, I, I get it. You're in phase. Who else in that team is going to be an in-game leader when he picks it up? Probably, probably no one. He's probably literally the only person who could have done it at that time to, to yeah. any kind of meaningful degree in, in my mind when I saw that happen. Now you have him picking up the op to be some kind of a hybrid player. It's like, please, no, someone else can do the op. Have someone else do it. Have Jax do it if you if whoa, you're not gonna whoa, there's literally a monic man. Like have what? Jax or yeah, yeah, I'm fine with it. Malik or thing. Like Dude, Nico <laughs> I'm Jax is obviously an extreme example, but take it like why are we putting it in Nico's hands? Why are we making someone who's been one of the top three players in the world constantly divide his attention but of trying to fill missing gaps in he's your curse. Team? You didn't know this about Nico, but he's actually cursed, right? Think about the in-game leader that he replaced in phase by taking yeah. it. Now think about the Orpa. Think about the pedestal Kenny's on as an Orpa, and he's taken that. That's why with Prof saying it, it hopefully it's temporary. Hopefully it is temporary, right? Yeah. And hopefully they keep Jackson, use him as a rotating six, like we all thought they should have done in the beginning, because I think that the kid has potential on some apps here. But the the like, we have three different buckets we need to discuss, first of all. We're kind of on the Nico one right now. And you're right. It almost feels like self-sabotaging right? He feels like self-sabotage throughout this guy's career. You can show us you can be this good, and then this decision gets made. It's like, what the fuck, yeah. right? Then you look at, then you then you pivot, right? This is the one I want to throw your way, striker, if we can. Yeah. The Kenny S bucket. Is is Kenny now joining that group with Guardian and, and Co, or is he coming back? Um, I wouldn't say he's done in the way that like Guardian seems to be, at least at this point. So I wouldn't put him in the same bucket at, at, at all. Like, sure, Kenny has definitely not been the Kenny. Where's uh, Can I look at the teams? I'm actually no. Not... Like, but that's what I mean. It's like probably at the more moment. fast though. And that's it's not going to be fast. Like, he could be he could be like in like one of these new you know European rosters that just like build around. It doesn't have to be the Flusha Flusha one, you know, Flusha sure. and Sunny one. Um, but some one of these like new ones that seem to prop up every year. Uh, around like some of the key players he could be like one of these key players who just helps bring up you know like some uh, a couple of new uh new guys Rangies. into the yeah could be as well sure um i don't think that's that's where it's gonna go i feel like it has to be like a european team if he wants to stay relevant um but that's where i would see his future at this point i don't think he's done though i don't think performance wise sure he hasn't he hasn't been up to par like in the past three months but before that he was still a very good opera well, we I think he, he's going to have to drop down to a lower tier, I think, to yeah, prove that he can still true. compete. I think it's the same with a lot of players at the moment. I think it's a lot, the same with a lot of players who, who who have been either let go or for whatever reason are without a team. With this situation, do you feel right now that there is a surplus of good players missing homes? Is is like Obviously, certain players are still under contract and you can't just get them for free, but there seems like right now that there is a lot of names that are, that are household Counter-Strike names that do not have a paycheck coming into their bank account every month from being a professional Counter-Strike player, at least on a professional team. I mean, surely because we're at this point in like economically in CS that simply some teams are leaving, some teams are leaving for Valorant, some for nothing, just like dropping their investment because there are no lands, there has been no major for two years. So people are just going to be turned away from CS and with that, especially some of the older players that have been a bit underperforming are just going to be left on the sidelines, right? And especially if, if they need to be bought out, then no one wants to pick them up. Like Kenny S right now, I'm sure is not going to be a cheap player to get. Like for sure, G2 isn't just going to give him away. Uh, and then you have like free agents, but maybe a bit older experienced free agents that maybe also don't want to sign for like 3K US dollars per month, right? So. From the combination of that, I think that also helped maybe the Russian scene, the CIS scene mm. explode so so much this year because these guys aren't getting like massive salaries. They can live with much less and just play, right? So I think that is helping them right now. Still got have, huge buyouts though. 
<laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's not really doesn't really scale like that. It doesn't seem like uh, in that that part of the world. Protecting uh, them from Navi. They they do now. They do now. <laughs> Just to to uh, bring this back to the upping issue. So far, G2 have played one match with this with this, and it was like a show match against Sinners um, that happened yesterday, two days ago. I don't remember exactly. Okay. Um, and there, Amonic was upping on Inferno. I think was, Nico picked it up for like a couple of rounds, but Amonic was upping on Inferno most of the time, as far as I could uh, as far as I could tell. So maybe they either didn't change their mind or it was a show match. They didn't really give a shit. Maybe it was just a map specific thing where yeah. Nico's maybe not not upping on Inferno or it's just like secondary upping and he's upping everywhere else. Whatever like that, it could just come down to roles. But at least based on that one map, Amonic uh, was picking just, it up. Just more. to conclude one thing, we all agree that Kenny has like the cut is deserved though. Uh, yeah, he I'd, wasn't I'd performing so. in that team. Sure. I feel like I was just hearing like six months ago the the 30th round of uh, the Kenny S's back chorus. Was that started by Anders? <laughs> Listen, I, I like to think that at this point in my life, I've learned how to just filter out everything that Anders said. <laughs> it might have been from him, but it's very possible. But I feel like there was one recently. I think, yeah, it's, I don't know. The, the Kenny S thing is hard. I think it's, it's also difficult. There's so many like young, talented players right now that when you start getting into whatever buyout he's going to have and whatever salary he's going to ask for, you start looking at, you're, like players are going to start getting looked at like you know you know like cost benefit type situation you know hmm. where it's like it used to be fine you just pay not not fine but you know anyone could get this salary but now it's going to be like if we can get a player who's going to deliver 80 percent of what you can and we're getting them for 5k a month why would we want to pay you 25k a month mm -hmm. and i think that's that's going to be it's going to be i think it's going to be a wake-up call for a lot of a lot of current current players and pros um, I hope it's not, but I think, you know, they, they're, they're going to find like, there's not always going to be those, those organizations out there willing to pay that high level of a salary at the moment. There's one player I'd be looking at if we were, if we were considering this to be a temporary situation for G2, there's one player that could potentially become available in the near future, which is Nevera because of the, yeah. because of the issues that Vitality have with, you know, the six man roster that they won't be able to use it all the time this year. Yeah. And so like their approach might shift, uh, as, as much as everybody else's. So if he becomes available, he's definitely a guy that I would look towards to maybe add to uh, to that roster. Yeah, well, the the limited experience he has is very good experience, right? And he he could fit that yeah. that role. That the problem for. is, I imagine Vitality have kind of made Locked sure that down. he's not he's not going to be that easy to get out. So yeah, you I think, think if they make a change, it's probably Masuda first. Could right? be anyway. Yeah, maybe maybe Masuda's playing better at the moment. Anyway, let's keep this moving. Uh, let's jump into the heroic news. If you missed it. Uh, this one here blindsided me a little bit, and then I went back and had to double check the the, the stats and whatnot. Uh, Burrup and Nico out. The Nico one comes as a bit more of a surprise. Burrup wasn't playing crazy good, but also considering his role, I don't know. I'm still a little bit on the fence about that one. Did we um, talk about this last week though? I'm pretty sure we've talked about this already. Have yeah. we? Yes. Did we talk about Shush and Refresh? Let me, let me, uh, yeah, uh, it was the same uh, day. I feel like what? Well, yeah, yeah. Hold up a second, James. We did talk. About now it. I'm not pointing the fingers and, at Prop and it's here. not and it's not on the thing though. So. All like right, well, not, not on my uh, not on my topic list. I, I have something to say about this topic and then we can move on. I am very, very, very happy to see refresh within a team. I actually really go. enjoyed watching him when he stood in for Cloud9 at mm -hmm. last Lisbon years back. I thought he had a yes. good job. I'm just excited to see what comes with it. I'm I'm happy that he's on a team. I never I never knew his story. I didn't know why after that that showing, which was like unanimously considered like a really good event to stand in, like individually from him. I never saw him on a team again after that. He got stuck in an optic contract. Oh, well that yeah. sucks. Well, that was he was also that not was very good in optic at the time, just because of, you know, God knows what well, that no one was getting that optic team. For, for, like, I feel like we can write that one off and just for, I like I'd kind of even forgotten that existed. So um good good for the young man. Okay, so that's the all we're going to talk about with Heroic for now. Uh, so thank you, Jason, for capping it off. I don't look so stupid. Uh, I mean, we can talk about them now. Nah, 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 no, 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 no. I'm just saying that the, the next topic is actually related to them because True. they were that qualifier. They will crop up. All right, here's a fun one for everybody playing at home. If you haven't caught this, over the last couple of days has been the DreamHack uh, Masters qualifier. Now, it was an open qualifier. We'll get into some little bits and bobs about that one. And now we have the closed qualifier, which is on right now. Cloud9 are playing uh, Voivoda, the uh, Bulgarian team who just beat OG. A winner of that one goes through as the third team for the DreamHack Masters Spring 2021 event, which is happening in about two months' time. Yep. Um, so that is on at the moment. Now, within the, the uh, open qualifier... Actually, uh, that, 
what the actual fuck? Why are we having qualifiers for like 53 days ahead of the event? That, Yo, like, let, let them happen. Let them happen now. Let them let them happen way in advance. Let's let's get it all out. I don't want any scheduling conflicts leading up to an event. Let's just get them all out of the qualifiers this, like, right away. Because we we expect them to actually travel to the event, so we want to like have everyone settled or well, whatever. But let's just literally kind of fifty three days point. away. But let's look at it this way, Prof. Right, the teams that we're talking about in this event: Complexity, Heroic, Cloud Nine, OG. Two of the names I just listed are Blast teams. Uh, so if you're ESL, which is DreamHack as well right now, and you're looking at this and there's a free week, the only other thing running in this week is, what was it, where it was last week was the Snow Sweet Snow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so right now, fuck all is going on. They can't do it during Pro League because a lot of these names are on during Pro League. They couldn't do it after Pro League because I'm pretty sure that's when the showdown's on and some of these teams yep. are in the showdown. And then the event's on. So the reason they're doing it now is probably for a lot of those factors and finding real estate in the calendar, probably not the easiest thing to do. A nightmare. I was surprised to see so many big name teams in the open qualifier, right? Because where's that list? You guys put it up. I'll link it to you, Lucas, so we can throw it up for everybody at home. I'm scrolling, scrolling. Here it is. Lucas, whack this one up for everybody at home to look at because I was watching these games and I enjoyed doing it. I did it through GoTV. So it was actually quite a lot of fun to be uh, to be having a having a you know watching it in the old school way. Um, but you can see here in this article, Sprout and MIBR, they didn't make it. I saw some tweets from Dennis uh, after that saying how he hates best of ones, which that's what it was within the open portion until the last two rounds, I think it was. Yeah. Um, obviously, we have Dignitas. Last round, I think even. Uh, Maybe it was just the last round. Yeah, I'm not 100% on that. We'll, we'll have to double check. Ants, Extreme, and Fnatic, they're all gone. Like the, the Fnatic loss to that Gron team was actually hilarious because those kids Did had you see set it up. Or... I was watching it. Yeah, because okay. Peter retweeted that link and the link was their bootcamp stream. I want to give oh, some yeah. props to these guys for, before we move forward from this. But they set up a stream where each of the guys had their POVs and it had their on webcam and it had their voice comps. Now it's Russian. I don't speak Russian, unfortunately. I'm sure it would have been fantastic if I did. But the cool thing that I thought they did was when they were in freeze time talking strats, they just threw up a splash screen and stopped the audio. So they could talk strats in the freeze time. Game went back live. As they're leaving spawn, audio comes back, everything. You get to watch it. It was really cool. I thought it was actually really well done by a team um, of that level, which is unknown to everybody, to do something like that. Anyway, the long story short here is all these teams getting upset along the journey, right? Now, I want to get into to a couple of different topics here. The first one being the fact that, Jason, if we were to run a 512 team open qualifier with best of threes, if you had to just guess off the top of your head, how long do you think that would take? Single elimination, best of three. That would, I don't know, probably well over a week, I would imagine. Yeah, I, and that would probably be if we were playing one game a day, right? I was so, going to say, you'd probably have to have like five streams set up to get that at, at all with any... Yeah, and, and this is the next thing, right? Like it was an open, it was a it was an open qualifier. So this is where it's getting crazy. We had so many high level names and good players within this thing at an open level that it's of there's like one or two official streams running when there's ten games at one time. They're best of ones, and people are saying they're random. I don't know if we can still be saying they're random. Like when I I must have a completely different understanding of the term random than everybody else, right? The term random to me is if I was to get like a, a box of M&Ms, I don't know if they come in boxes anymore, a bag of M&Ms, and I was to tip them all out on my table here from a height, they would fall randomly. But when we're talking about in the context of a Counter-Strike game, where one team that we have in the blue corner are a professional bunch of guys who get paid a salary of a decent amount of money, part of an organization, have a coach, all they have to do is play Counter-Strike, and they lose to the guys in the other corner who probably study, probably work as a stacking shelves, probably just play Counter-Strike, you know, like as a passion or hobby, or maybe they're trying to grind to become pro, but aren't getting a salary and they lose. And then we have so many of them lose. Is that random? Like explain random to me in a best of one environment. You mean you spend 12 hours a day practicing Counter-Strike to be a professional team and you can't win a pistol round. Is that random or is that you not being good enough? I don't know. I don't know. Like I'm asking- Pistol round's not a good question. example. Pistol round sometimes makes you feel a little bit random. But, it, but okay, so you <laughs> no, five-man you rush a box think, out, you get the bomb I, down, you win the round. Can anybody yeah, do that? I think uh, if I had to imagine, I mean, I don't, I don't actually, I don't, I don't, I didn't actually like see the tweet or the complaint, but I, I would imagine when, when they're frustrated about the randomness, it's um, lack of a, lack of a knowledge or lack of a feel for how the other team plays. I think usually when, when pro players talk about randomness in, in the game of Counter-Strike, it's just like the things that they're doing 
don't don't make sense in like the view of Counter Strike that we have built up. Which which yeah comes as you know comes down to the studying and the prep. I've become a Valve dev. No joke. I think I've become a Valve dev. Like not literally a Valve dev. You I think I've become. Shark. When you talk to somebody when at Valve, what they do is they ask you a question, right? When I went to Valve and I'm like, Valve, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like every pistol in the game could headshot me. And when we got rifles and we're anti-eco and the pistols are close and they kill us. The question the Valve devs goes, how, how do you think you should should deal with those type of buys instead of instead of me going oh well maybe we should play with more utility or try and do this or do that i'm like well that's not how it used to be in 1.6 right that's me dumb chad from years ago now when i read this stuff and people are going this is random or this is bad or this or that i go but why did you lose that situation like did you genuinely just lose that situation because it was online and you know this happened and that happened or are you maybe the way I look at this, right, right now, with all these teams winning all these upset matches, we can even look at the CIS teams in Katowice. We, all of this is encapsulated. What this environment right now that we're all experiencing is teaching the entire Counter-Strike world, or the entire world, is that there are a shitload of kids who can click heads, right? That is legitimate. They can do it in the comfort of their own bedroom and the individual level of these kids and how many tools there are for them to be able to learn. Smokes, flashes, uh, go, doing pre-fire servers, doing retake servers, doing this. The database now to be able to learn has been leveled, right? There's no more, oh, you're an old school player, so you carry all this residual knowledge. People like Carrigan and co are putting videos out on a fucking weekly basis of how to understand Counter-Strike. So the general player is higher. So now what we're looking at here is a disparity across the board of people who are working really, really hard for one thing and people who are working really, really hard for another thing. But these people who are trying to catch them are close because their skill some of these kids who are in teams that are not signed, not professionals, anything, are probably better individually than some of the pros that you guys watch now in the tier two, tier three teams, like without a doubt. Like I would, I would probably happily say that. But then in terms of teams, communication, understanding what it means to be a teammate, understanding what it means to compete under pressure, they don't have those things, right? But what we're learning in this environment when there is no pressure is that a lot more players can compete. And whether you call them an onliner, whether they're, you know, you think whatever the fuck, this is what we're in right now and they're able to compete how far back are we meant to go here striker like with best of threes how many chances do we give these professional teams what do we do because right now clearly there's a there, there's a disparity right should this many pro level teams be losing to this many semi pro level teams um probably not um i mean the, another thing to point out is that pistols just simply don't have as much effect as, as, as they used to right just because the, the the inherent economy changes and stuff like that uh that's made the the game much more prone to comebacks and and all that stuff. Uh, and so obviously the best of one discussion is definitely a weird one at this point, just because just based on that, I get Jason's point for sure though, uh, in terms of, because you you can meet like one of the 300 teams, you know, in these qualifiers or something, and it's fucking impossible to be ready for every single play style that they have to offer. Of course. So it's definitely difficult to to go through these these qualifiers and I understand why, but to post that as pose that as, a, as, as an excuse is, uh, is not great for me. What what, are you, what would one, you look at as a solution here, Prof? One thing that I also want to point out, when you look at the, the quarterfinal matchups of the open qualifier, mm -hmm. like we we said, there are a lot of upsets. So Sprout, MIBR, Windstrike, Dignitas, Ants, Extreme, um, Fnatic all went out. Yep. And that's fine. But the teams that went through are Nordovin, SG Pro, K23, Singularity, Hard Legion, Budapest 5, Movie Star Riders, 7 out of 8. These are all salary teams okay. these are not semi-pro teams and then the last team is the voivoda bulgarian mix with also players that we know quite well right yeah so it's not like they lost to a bunch of kids maybe maybe they lost didn't lose to these teams but in the end the teams that went through are still salary teams professional semi-professional let's say compared to a team liquid but not like on a super lower level than sprout right so sure. these guys are probably most of them have a coach boot camp here and there, like practice normal hours, don't have other jobs. So it's, the thing is that, that we just have a shit ton of fairly good teams that are trying hard and you are going to lose in an open qualifier bracket. I think the problem we have here is that there are not either not enough open qualifiers that, that we don't have an, enough people going through the shit and getting ran, randomly losing to a lower, lower team. Mm. Or that, and that we have so many invites that blast team, ESL teams, all of these teams never have to go through yes. this because they're partners. So they're never going to feel this randomness aspect 
they're always just going to be there in the in the top 16 and some other teams will crash out and then they'll crash out of the top 30 because they don't qualify for two events in a row then they're not going to get the invites to the close qualifier and then that like propels itself forward right sure sure no i i think that's a very good point right and that was something that i i definitely there's so many topics i want to talk about here tonight um let's quickly wrap up the recent news and then we will get into more open slather and just see where this goes because we were only going to have about half an hour left after we get through this last bit all right so let's let's just get through this last thing uh some updates in north america as far as teams are going triumph added uh and a new kid, obviously, if you missed their changes, they had uh, Cooper and stuff come in. They kind of had to revamp their roster. They still have Shake Zula and stuff. There is the new kid's name Cynical. Is that it? Was that it? Uh, Some, something like that. Is it Cynic, Cynic or something? Cynic, Cynic, yeah. Right. And and I think yes. First, is he good, Jason? I think so. Yeah. Now okay. Then. Cool. Nice. That's that helps. And uh, <laughs> over there, that's your we... contribution. I thought you were like <laughs> that's all excited we need. about this guy. I was just trying to give him the confidence. I don't know if it's true. I just wanted him <laughs> to feel like he was doing it right. All right, and then Extra Salt, which is the team with uh, Sonic, JT, uh, and Co. They had Mottum. They replaced Mottum with uh, Bark. Marky. That's the one. That's the one. Marky's on there now. Okay, so that's all your North American news. I know Jason's trying to save it, but we aren't here at HLTV.org. Um, yeah, I was going to say, that's a really quick news segment for, for an entire region. <laughs> well, we it's don't know. Bad. Like, the, yeah, you, yeah. you can tell us off I'm, your I'm player. I'm not blaming you. I'm just good. saying there's not a whole lot going on. At the we'll monitor your results. Uh, okay. against them in the dream <laughs> event to <laughs> see how it goes all right now we're going to get into a really fun topic everybody because this is where this is where we're going to have so much fun and jason and i are going to have very different views um oh is this the one this is the one so north american counter-strike seems to have found themselves a beautiful little pedestal that they put themselves up on to act like throughout the history of counter-strike they've had a really big scene Here's the truth of the matter, ladies and gentlemen. When I was there playing professionally, there was a shitload of other professional teams who were just stealing paychecks because they either didn't try very fucking hard or they weren't very fucking good and shouldn't have been getting paid the amount of money that they were. Now, the fact that this COVID shit has happened and we can't run events in North America right now, for whatever reason that may be, has given the Americans some kind of a thought process that their country was actually kind of relevant in the Counter-Strike scene. Now, in terms of having good teams in the last couple of years, EG and Liquid were fucking fantastic. And North America was also a home to the Brazilian and Australian teams to give them a platform. However, North American Counter-Strike feels like very entitled to me at the moment, Jason, and I'm struggling with it because it's really grinding my gears when there are so many people from all over the world who have given up a lot more than what the North Americans have done to chase their dream. And I feel, and I definitely don't, this is not directed at you because you're a man of reason and you're the man I come to before I make dumb tweets. But, but, don't always at, help, but yeah. at, when I'm feeling that, am I feeling that misplaced? Because you can tell me from the North American standpoint, because I'm really having a hard time reading the bullshit. I don't, I don't think, I mean, as far as I know, I haven't gotten the sense that anyone is like trying to put it put North American counter shake up on like a pedestal and try to make it feel more important than, than it, than it potentially is. But I think, I think there's two kind of ways to, to kind of approach the conversation. I think if you, if you take the angle right out of the gates, that it's a bunch of entitled kids who play video games for a living, like it's always going to end with some kind of a negative look on it. I actually, um, I think, I think there's a big difference and i mean you you get to be a little bit harsher on this than i think most people because you actually did have to live that dream where you left australia to, to travel across the world to make this work but i think there is a big difference between um like let's say the australians having to do that and brazilians as well who generally have to leave brazil and move to america for long stretches of and leave everything behind um then to like a north american or a european teams and players doing it because there's there's the mental acceptance when you decide you're going to do it you mentally know i am leaving australia for however long it might be to try and make this work or i'm leaving brazil for however long it is to make this work when you're a north american and you're making the decision of whether you want to go pro and counter-strike you know at the time a bunch of these guys started there was 
two ESL Pro League seasons that were done online in North America. There was at least one, I think, two um, two Face It seasons going on at the, at the same exact time. We've had a couple blast stops. We had E-League seasons. We've had two majors. We've had every single year IEM Oakland, which then became IEM Chicago. We've had ESL New York, and we've usually had a Pro League final down in Dallas. So you've had elements of the scene that have operated in North America, and slowly over the years is what we've seen is those get stripped away slowly and slowly we no longer have you know pro league made the decision that they want to have all the teams on land for one event that's over in europe and especially due to covid now it's obviously crazy circumstances so two two pro league seasons got taken away um face it did the same thing they took away their two online seasons so there, there go those as well those were like you know three weeks to a month that north american players had to at least experience their job at home in mm -hmm. the states um should, like, you know, Oakland was always around and moved to Chicago. ESL New York was always around and moved to Chicago. Obviously, now due to COVID, we can't have them here. But we've seen this progression of all these events that if you're a pro player, you're like, oh, yeah, I've spent a lot of time in Europe. But I've got these these four, five, six events throughout the, you know, the Dream Act Masters, the Dream Act Opens, where I can be in North America, where I have a two-hour flight instead of a 16-hour flight. Um, and I get to go home and I get to see my family, where I can bring friends and family to the event and I can see them there. And it's, it's all kind of been been taken away so all of, a, all of a sudden i think as a north american player at the moment you're sitting here and you're like i think part of you has got to be feeling this isn't what i signed up for like i wouldn't have done this if this was going to be the situation that we'd be in and so. i think there's a lot of understanding around COVID as well but i think i mean listen it's it's hard to tell because i know i went through this last year when i was trying to work through the schedule that we would have as a team to start this year and if i if we had just kind of accepted all of the calendar counter-strike schedule as it was um, you know, I think, I think we'd be in Europe, like 80 plus percent of the, of the year. Yeah. And like, I, I realize that, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't see a whole lot of entitlement. I realize there's going to be pro players who probably feel a little bit more of entitled, um, than, than the average, but hang on, where was I going with that one? Fuck. I feel I, like I just I lost have a it. question, Moses. Yeah. Uh, obviously you defended your boy Liege here because this is essentially what he said on Twitter. And I understand that. Like I defend my best player as well. Like I'd, I'd do anything at that point. And some of the things that you said are fair, but do you not think that it, the, the fact that they cut back all of these things first pro league for then, I don't know, land events slowly, they were going away even before COVID. I think we had less and less in NA. Isn't that fair? Comp when you take into account like the lower viewership on like pro league matches, the quality of the teams, the the number of orgs in, in NA, the yeah, the amount of people coming to LAN events, right? To arena events. But stuff then like you that. have to then you have to ask the tournament organizers are they how much do then you will not just turn more but you pretty much have to ask the, the entire counter-strike scene in general if if we think na is worth investing into because i mean if you're just going to continually pull all the resources out of it you're never going to see those numbers turn around so if north america is important to the business of counter-strike then at some point you are going to have to reinvest into this region and get some of that stuff up to par. And yeah, a lot of it falls on us within the region to do that first, to prove that we're willing to warrant more, more reinvestment. And it, it comes on a lot of the young players in Counter-Strike right now in North America to prove that they're good enough to get up there. But I don't find anything entitled about players saying, I want to have a life. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't be going to Europe for 80% of the year. How much longer is it going to happen? Uh, okay. Okay. That one right there. Like I can see both. And I made the argument last week. I've actually probably been, people probably didn't watch the whole thing. So they took it all, may have taken it out of context. I didn't, I don't check social media after this podcast. Just the backlash is never yeah, yeah. fun. Yeah, it's, um, it's tough. But when I spoke about the Ethan situation last week, I was I I would say what I was was more than understanding, right? Like COVID has given a lot of different people a lot of different perspectives. Now, if Ethan's perspective that he has taken away is that I want to spend more time in the, the house that I'm building with the girl that I'm in love with and I want to be closer to my family and I still want to compete in video games, but I want to do that at home, right? Which is how everything happens. And the only way I can do that is through Valorant. That's great because I know where his priorities are. I know that he is never going to be a Michael Jordan of Counter-Strike. He's going to be a good Counter-Strike player because mechanically he's fucking brilliant. And he's a very good player. But he's putting those things before wanting to be one of the best players in the world. Now, for you and me, Jason, and for, for the other older boys who are doing this, we, right, the older we get, and this is something that you went through 
earlier than me and I was still a blindsided idiot and I didn't see it. And now I do. But the idea that there is more to life than just this, right? Like in only recently have I gone, only recently since they told me I can't have I gone, I want to go home and see my family or, you know, like I'm getting older now. I want to be back in a place that, you know, I have really good memories of and start building my life and stuff there. If these players want to decide to do that now when they're between the ages of 18 and 25 and they openly come, Ethan never came out with any bullshit. He didn't come out with any bullshit and go, you know, this is why I'm going. Counter Strike is fucking sucks. And I think that he just went, yeah. I'm going. And I respect the shit out of that kid for doing it that way, right? And and I'm not sitting here and, and and trying to make an argument that that should be condemned because I think if that is the choice that people want to make, then fine, that is the choice that they should go and make on their own volition and get it done. Here's the problem I have: you can't that the, the having your cake and eat it for the players that do want to compete professionally. And the world changes all the time, right? It, no matter whether it's with COVID or not, we were we were aware. Like one time we have IEM Chicago, the next time there's no Chicago, it's all New York, it's all this, it's that. We do debt, like you're saying, but. With, with the with the, the constant flux of the landscape, it's not, do I want to be a professional Counter-Strike player in North America? It's, do I want to be a professional Counter-Strike player? Because if the goal is to be a professional Counter-Strike player in North America, you can sit at home and you can stream with Mo and Ocean and all those guys. You can make some money. You can do that, right? Like, you can give that a crack. You can play ESCA. You can win Rank S. You can make yourself a little bit of money. Do you want to be the best Counter-Strike player slash team in the world? Yes. Okay. Where do you have to do that? Europe. Has that ever been any different? No. Occasionally, we came over for a CPL occasionally cgs no that's Elite not Blue that's money. not true it is like europe's always played a big part and i'm not going to sit here and act like north america is this critical piece of the puzzle that that has to always i don't know be around but i mean i think that's a question that you're you're bringing into the conversation that the answer is always just going to like you know that this is this is the heart of the issue is what's the point of being a professional anything if you can't if it doesn't allow you to have a life if it doesn't allow you to have some the of the profession things. That's, yeah, but that's why people do things like we like we have. Ours is not like we're not accountants, right? This is the bit that irks right. me with certain people's fucking uh, angles on this shit is that they go, "Oh, yeah, but I still need to have a life." Who says, right? This is not a normal person job. You don't live by the nine to five Monday to Friday shit as a professional Counter Strike player. And yeah. anybody who thinks you do can get the fuck out, right? Because that's not what we do. That's not what elite level sports people on anything do. That's not what elite level thinkers on any level do. You think the kid who's fucking super quick at doing the Rubik's Cubes is worried about any other bullshit than Rubik's Cubes? The kid goes to bed with Rubik's Cubes, I bet. Like this, my point is to do something yeah. which is this, you have to, this has to be number one. And and I think we all did that with Counter-Strike. I remember when I was starting to play Counter-Strike and it was probably the same for you is you go to school because you're required. You get home and you play Counter-Strike until you go to bed and then you turn off the lights for an hour so mom and dad go to sleep. Yeah. And then you're right back on your <laughs> PC playing Counter-Strike again until six in the morning. And then you wonder why you're failing all your morning classes. It's because you're sleeping through all of them. Like everyone who's played Counter-Strike or got into an eSport on this level, it has been the obsessed, the, the singular point of obsession for a number of years, but that can't keep up. Like you, you just burn out. You, you, it can't like it works for three, four years. You get to a point and then you find a girlfriend and then you have the money to buy a house and then you start going out to dinner. And it's, it's like, it's not that you're putting like shit amounts of time into counter-strike or your job or your profession, but there are other parts of it that have to be developed. You need to have a balance. And I think we've all seen someone who's gone a little bit crazy because there's no balance in their life and it's just focused on one thing. I wasn't going to say it, but yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you're like, I know what Henry's like. I know what Henry's <laughs> like. I know what Duncan's like when you're, when you're Mentalist. eight weeks deep into a 10 week grind of working counter-strike events away from home, everyone fucking breaks down. And I think people are losing, losing sight of the fact that everyone at the moment vilifies Valorant as the biggest, the biggest opponent to Counter-Strike. In my mind, Counter-Strike, the biggest issue, the biggest opponent to Counter-Strike at the moment is the fact that we haven't been able to make this scene, this economy around the game, and the schedule work. How many years... Have players, have talent, have been broadcasters been saying this scene is oversaturated, there's too much going on, we can't do anything. How many years have we been talking about it and still nothing changes? So when you see players start to kind of lash out a little bit more about this schedule and be a little bit force, more forceful in denouncing it, it's because they've been raising the alarm bells for years and nothing has changed. And so especially for North American players where they're looking at a calendar where it's like, yeah, you know, this is true. COVID has made this a real bitch and it's going to be a real obstacle. It's going to be difficult, but you know what? We can suck it up for the, for the year and get through it as all these tournaments are going to be in Europe for the TOs. Okay. But what happens next year? 
what happens next year if the schedule comes out and they say we have to, you know, there's, we, we need to find some way to make this work. Like it, it just, otherwise the answer to your question, Chad, is do you want to be a professional counter-strike player or do you want to be a professional counter-strike player in an A? The, the answer is just going to become no, because it's not a healthy lifestyle in any way. Yeah, like that, that's, what that's just the way it's going to be. And that's and that's why I think we've seen all of the the tier two North America go to Valorant. That's why I think we've seen Ethan go. That's I think Ethan and Nitro, uh, with what they have going in their lives, they're playing the same boat, right? Here's my question: Is there some North American Counter Strike player that is that is not doing their job at the moment that is saying this? Like I feel like there's like a real like misunderstanding that when you when people say this is their job, this is what you know, this is your responsibility and this is what you have to do. And it's true. This is your job and there's an obligation, there's a certain responsibility that must be met. But is there someone, is there like a player in North America that I don't know that isn't that isn't going and spending a shit ton of time in Europe, that it's doing all these events, that's doing media, that's doing that's doing their own social media, that's building their own like is there a player that is saying, you know, fuck this, I'm just not doing anything at all? Like I don't want to do it. It's in Europe, I'm out. Like there's no, not a single one but, not living up to their responsibility, but what everyone is saying now is this is crazy. Like this cannot be a long-term thing where we have to where we have to sacrifice every other part of our lives. Like how many birthdays do we have to miss? How many weddings? How many births of a nephew or a cousin or a brother or a sister? How many things do we have to miss before it's okay to say, guys, this is fucked up? Well, like, at that's, the moment, I hope I think all that's of them. the point. <laughs> yeah, at, at the moment, I hope everyone's right, right, right. But you know what I mean, but, like. <laughs> no, I do know what you're saying, right? And I think that I think that this is the point, though, is the sense that what do we look at this as? Because uh, I want to bring striker and prof in here because they're they're currently refereeing this. <laughs> um, but but my my point where I want to pivot with this is, I like I, Moses's points just just to say um, I'm on Moses' side. Oh yeah, and my refereeing right now. All right, no, actually, that's a good that's this is good. This is a good place to leave this. Prof, set us up with something, and then we'll pivot to striker. Like, yeah, so, I, I think it's important to note that this situation didn't happen out of nowhere. And as Moses said, it's not like Valorant only or COVID only or whatever. Uh, it was going in a certain direction, especially like North American CS in for quite a while. And I know that Chris J got into a lot of shit for saying what he said. And it wasn't really worded the best way, I guess, when he said like NA CS has already been dead or whatever. Sure. Uh, about the whole discussion about EPL moving and stuff like that. But it has been going into that direction. And even when we had some things, let's say one of the things that I feel like ESL tried to get more viewership for NA matches is to put the NA matches early, early on in the morning. People didn't like that either to get those matches in EU-friendly time zones, right? It's a lot of these things that I feel like it, no one really cared to think about it long term and everything was like now short term whatever like we had pro league with 12 na or 14 na teams those teams did fuck all to have good teams or to build brands or to make that that league more interesting right mm -hmm. and then we just like then we just downsized and downsized those na side na and in the na region less invites less invites because 2013 or 14, whatever, I feel like for some tournaments, we had like NA and EU 8-8 eight, eight or whatever. Yeah. A number of teams. And then three teams would be maybe good from NA and five would be like absolute trash. And of course, it makes sense to move in this direction because they don't have the fan base, don't have the quality. You can't keep inviting those teams, right? And that's how we got where we are now. So there is responsibility on the players and the organizations as well, and not just the TOs or magically other games appeared, right? We're just at this point where some players will leave because there's like greener pastures and that's fine. But as you said, then you're not like a elite CS competitor. And and that's fine, right, Striker? If if you want to go and play Valorant and stuff, you you cool with them going? What what do you think? I mean I I feel like if they want to go then it's they should not worth go. <laughs> trying to keep them keep them here, right? Like there's there's obviously something that's keeping them that's uh that's uh forcing them to make this move, right? So it's probably not a good idea to just force them to force them to stay. They're just going to end up being unhappy being here, right? So I think that there's no point in, well, first of all, there's no point in hating anyone, anybody who actually moves on. It's just, you know, shit happens, right? They, they're just going to have to have to make the choices that they want to make in their lives. Um, but uh, when it comes to, I mean, I understand why people have started to cut down on North America. There was something that actually somebody posted to me like 10 minutes ago or something that said that only like 3% of 
CSGO, like matchmaking players in CSGO are from North America. 3%. 3%. Well, I mean, this is like one day on like a peak day or something on Friday, December the 4th. And I can see like North America has like 3% of the players where EU has, I don't know, over 25 or something like that. Like over a fourth of the of the, of the matchmaking players uh, playing at that time. So does that include Russia when you say EU players? Uh, this is like, there's like servers, EU North, EU West, EU East. I imagine it that that has to include in, uh, Russia as well. Sure. Okay. Well, that, see, like that stat line in itself, if it was just like, if we considered like Central Europe or Western Europe and stuff, we could probably work it out. But like, what is there? 380 million people in North America, right? Something like three. Some, yeah, yeah. Something like that. And, but Russia has a shitload as well. So that's going to kind of skew the way we could compare those stats. But I, mean, I, I don't think there's any doubt. I don't think many people would argue that Counter-Strike isn't hugely popular in North America, right? No. So no, that's not the argument, but, uh, but I mean, it's a separate argument. I mean, now we're just kind of bringing two different things. Like I, I listen, I think I'm the first person. If you ask over the years, I've been highly critical of the NA scene. And I think there's about a hundred things that can be done better that could have been done better, better in the past. Obviously with hindsight, that's an easy one, but that can be done better moving forward to make the scene a little bit better. Um, but that's, that's a different discussion than, you know, we're, we're talking one about our NA players entitled for wanting to have a life and then. There's yeah, only three sure. percent right. of you know, the matchmaking. Well, like it's, it's a completely different conversation. I mean, it, okay, it's all connected so to, in some way. So just to bring this back into yeah, what Moses is talking about, I when even when you look at like the the world's top athletes, they of course they have periods in their lives where they're just fucking no life completely, right? Just focused on the league or whatever it's going on in their professional career, right? But they have much bigger breaks in the meantime. Like they sure. they they we don't really have proper off seasons where there's like three months, not nothing, nothing's going on. Right. While in normal, normal sports, this is like a, a pretty normal thing to have, right. To have three months off or something where you're like in whatever semi mode or whatever you want to call it, where you're just kind of, kind of like trying to stay, stay in shape and trying to focus on what you can maybe improve for the next season, but you're not going hard at it while you're in the season, you know, stuff like that. So I think there's definitely something to, to what Jason is saying that there needs to be some sort of a balance and not just basically like 10 months out of 12 that you have are just are just like pretty much 24 7 cs or you know close to it so i definitely see his point so what would you do in all this like, yeah that, uh, that's what i want to go in, let's do it, uh, let's find some answers i don't I like this part i'm out this is the one <laughs> i don't like just like for this year like if, if we look at what is being done where uh, the cash cups come as one of the things which is quite a bit of prize money cash cups every, are nice, yeah. every every two weeks right um, so. uh, I'm I'm not sure. I haven't actually been here for any of them, so I I haven't been keeping track of the schedule. He but I know that winning a bunch. I know the 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 cash cups are are a nice addition. I know um, DreamHack. I think with uh, shifted some prize pool, so these North American DreamHack opens have a little bit more prize money into them to try and get a few more teams and a few more uh, more teams signed up and everything like that. I think actually one of the things that I think can be a huge, huge saving grace for the North American scene, um, and a lot of it relies on on us and Furia, um, I, I actually think there's a world in which the Brazilian scene and the North American scene can kind of really help each other out and give each other a leg up. They can be like puzzle pieces that fit perfectly together in terms of Brazil having a player base, in terms of North America having a few more facilities and infrastructure and money to get them, you know, in a, in a right place. But I mean, you know, if this Fallen playing with Liquid works out, if Junior playing with Furia works out and both of those teams show really good things, I think those are actually two very important roster moves that have happened recently that can kind of show Brazilian and North American teams, like a North American team can, can go out and get a Brazilian player or two, or a Brazilian team can go out and get a North American player or two. And I think those two scenes, we might be able to actually help each other to having some kind of a scene. And, and then it would maybe no longer be North American. It would just be an America scene, um, which could be interesting. But I, but I think that's a good way to go. Obviously, the cash cups was something that I told ESL. A um, couple of us told ESL when we had conversations, they, they reached out to a few people to talk about how to fix and how to improve uh, conditions in the region. We we thought that having those smaller tournaments like what Europe has with the what snow, sweet snow, there was another big one that was happening some last year, the ones that Complexity played in a while back. Like those online cups that last like four days are way, way better than having like an MDL season because nobody's following an entire MDL season across, I don't know, 10 weeks or however long they were. Yeah. Um, but those those smaller events are great for just like short, build up a little bit of hype around it and, you know, just kind of tune in when you, when you want and you have those four days. Um, 
Yeah, I think also, I mean, if you want to look at something that hurt that needs to get rectified, hurt the scene that I think can get fixed and actually can bring it back, uh, you know, I think the entire ESCA versus face it, FPL versus rank S like was was extremely damaging to the North American scene when all the focus like ESCA used to be our community hub. When Counter-Strike collapsed in North America the first time right after CGS, ESCA was the saving grace. That's where the community was. That's where the servers were. That's where they started to spawn the league play out of that. That's where you had team practice servers so you could have an infrastructure that was way easier to access than one person organizing it all for the team. Um, and I think ESCA started to more and more focus on rank S and started to focus more and more on being like a support system for ESL tournaments and qualifiers and stuff like that. And it took away from the community, which you can just see over years, that, that lack of community just eventually starts to erode. And now as we're seeing, the bottom has given out and, and we need to reestablish. So yeah, Nene is in a really bad spot right now, but I actually think if we start focusing on things like these weekend events for the semi-pro teams, if we get you know ESCA to be more community focused or heaven forbid a new company comes in and becomes that community hub for, for the Counter-Strike scene in North America, you can actually have a, something where this strain actually this, this, this scene actually bounces back pretty strong because look, we don't see it in, in Europe is better, but every esports game is, is a scary, really top heavy environment. Like the semi pro in every esports game is the scary position where if you're not having to, yes, someone said in chat mythically, I think Flom and mythic do a great job with that as well. Just wanted to give them a shout out. Um, but you you have to be able to establish the semi-pro scene or the second tier scene because that's what provides opportunities for players to even be able to consider going professional. Like it is that stepping stone from being able to say you're actually you're actually competing and challenging on the semi-pro level, and then you can build up to being a professional instead of just taking some gigantic risk leap of faith, which we've all had to do, but it's not necessarily fun. Like it is at the time. But that's a big risk to just being able, like, to say I'm dropping, I'm dropping all of college. Like when I was when I was younger, it was, do you really want to skip all of college? And you know, college back then still had a reputation that it was actually going to be something a little bit more meaningful than it is now. But I would have had to just leave college and go full time pro. My brother did that, and it was it was difficult. He tried to make it into the CGS and and kind of you know kind of ignored college in that sense. So um, you know, having those opportunities for semi pro players to build up into being a professional, and then you will actually build professionals who have experience building their brand and being able to actually deliver things on social media and deliver content to these organizations as they build up through it. And you're not just kind of diving 100% in right out of the gate. Do you think, because the goalpost that we're, we're talking about here is, is from grassroots and up, right? And I think that is something which in a lot of scenes around the world has probably, well, has definitely been hampered because of COVID because we can't get the local lands, which is where the yeah. really, really grass screw stuff happens, right? Back, I, I think for most of us here, when we all started playing Counter-Strike at some level, we'd go to like either BYOC lands or land at a land cafe type thing, right? That's where you'd meet other like-minded people, you'd have your first teams, and then from there, you, you'd make your way up. Obviously, that ESCA thing has hurt that a lot. Um, and and I think that we had Sevo as well for you guys. There was there was a yep. lot. Like there was a lot from all over the country. Cal, which is going way back. But one of the things that that like at the if we look towards the the top level, right? And this we want a funnel. It has to be a funnel, right? You want the the, the largest part of the funnel at the top, capturing all the all the casuals, all the semi professionals, all the people who are playing in fun leagues and shit. And we want to narrow them all the way down to the best that North America can produce, right? At the moment. You guys have EG and Liquid. Um, I don't we've got think a, we... we've got a dish disposal. We just got things chopped, falling into the blender. It's not even a funnel. Well, yeah. Just... So you're just hoping that if you you get something on the other end that tastes good. But my 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 focus here is is I think first of all, do you agree with this sentiment that at one point I'm talking 2015, 2016, that maybe North America was a little bit overinflated. There was too many people making money who probably weren't of the professional level, like it is in Valorant right now. There are so many professional Valorant teams. There is no way in a couple of years' time when League of Legends come in and they tighten that League of Legends, when Riot come in and they tighten it up and they turn it into a franchise league, that all these players still have that income, right? They make make Haywell the same shines almost. Yeah, but I mean, we also we also kind of knew that. I don't know how publicly it was kind of discussed at the time. We also kind of knew that there was a lot of like really artificial growth in terms of the salaries, in terms of how many people were getting paid at that time because twenty start of 2016 is when... 
I think Counter Strike as an esport blew up to the attention of people who didn't know about Counter Strike. Yeah. So that's when you started getting the COD orgs coming in, and that's where you started getting at already established orgs in other games. The League of Legends teams were coming in and splashing money around, and salaries at that time were so low that they came in and had some easy marks in terms of let's get these guys, let's pay them five thousand dollars more than they're used to getting, or you know, three couple thousand dollars more. But I mean, you just kind of know at that time when it has the hype of the entire gaming scene or esports scene all together yeah there's going to be a lot of people they're casting wide nets and hoping to get hoping to get a gem so but we, so with this if we follow this line of thought there that yeah it exploded at one point but now we're tightening that and getting a like a little bit more realistic i think the same thing's happening in europe people aren't getting the crazy salaries that they were once getting we're not spending 25 30 grand on players every day of the week now as it seemed like for some period of time right um but where do you as 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 the savior of North America, what do you think the baseline for professional teams from your region is? Because the one point we haven't touched on here is that North America still has the highest in terms of sponsor budgets. You guys just have a money printing machine over there, right? So in terms of sponsor budgets, that's why North America is one of it is the most important region with a purse from, baby yeah you, you it's the money right but if we take Fury out of the mix um and we take MIBR out of the mix um which maybe isn't fair because I don't know if they're an American company or not, or a North American company or not. So, but, but let's let's for argument's sake say they're not. EG and Liquid are. How much room for other professional teams is there, or how many do you think would make sense? Because you can't have there has to be teams who are a couple of steps down from you guys, and there has to be teams who are a couple of steps down from them as well. You can't have six or seven teams going over from North America right, competing right. in Katowice, for example. Yeah. Uh, where do you where would you put the number do you think like three four what are we talking uh i mean i think if you want to i mean again technicality on terms of the it's calling it a north american team but i think there's there's room for maybe like three maybe four really good teams from the region but i think probably just two to three purely north american teams i think because i don't know again the conversation is weird because eventually when the brazilians can get back into north america you'd, you'd add them all in right i sure. imagine most australian teams would be coming to north america instead of europe could be wrong on that. I, no, don't I think know that's changing anyone... now. I, okay. I think now with the reason we went Renegades to America. Renegades in Europe right now, aren't they? Yeah, the reason we went to America before was because we had the stepping stones of like it wasn't going to be like we'd go over there and bend over and get destroyed by every uh, by every European team, uh, and it was kind of easier as well to get into yeah. the leagues because the competition yeah. wasn't as high, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, I think I think realistically on like a world scale, competing at like the Colognes and the Katowice, probably probably maybe one one more team from the region. Three, three, four, maybe. So we're not far off the mark, though, really, when we think about it, right? Because Cloud no, but Nine historically, and Complexity spent like, money elsewhere. Well, and also historically, like Counter Strike, even even back in like 1.6 days, didn't really. All, it wasn't like Europe, where like there was 20 teams from North America that were competitive. It was always kind of just like there was, you know, your your 15, 16 European teams, and then there were like three, four North American teams who were in there as well. Like it's never had a high volume of teams of these top tier competitions. I don't think it necessarily has to 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 be a healthy scene. We're just we're missing everything beneath us. Okay. You know, the, just the drop off from the pros is so crazy. And the problem with that is, when you get a pro now in, in one of these teams, like like an Ethan, um, who either wants to switch a game or maybe he's just done competing, maybe he wants to I don't know go be a streamer, maybe he just doesn't want to play Counter Strike, whatever it might be. Like the the drop off to go get a new player who can step up is is just so so far. Like Oboe's maybe the Oboe's going to get away with one because he spent time in complexity competing with them for for a year um but but yeah i mean the things that you have to teach players coming up now is just it's a lot it's like the drop off is just is just there all aim no brain kind of situation probably a lot yeah which is yeah which is which is I, th I mean i think as far as problems go it's better to say one. all yeah. aim no brain instead of all brain no aim like sure. that would really suck i'd much rather have all aim no brain yeah, no, that makes sense. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we've hit 10 o'clock. I told Jason we'd have him for two hours. So, Jason, I'm going to yeah. pose this to you. We haven't touched the EPL at all. If you would like to go, you are more than welcome to go. And, and me, Prof and Striker can do EPL and close out the show. I don't want to hold you. You said you have to go for dinner a little bit later. Yeah, I do have dinner. I told him I'd be there at 4.30, which is in 30 minutes. It's about a 15-minute drive. So you should should probably get a move on, I suppose. I don't, I don't want to keep you for too long. Is it? Can we? Is, is there like a smaller thing we can skip around to and you guys can come back to Pro? There is. Take off? Prof, we got any quick viewer questions for Jason? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Let me, let me just check. Let me I, didn't, check. I didn't request access to the document. We, we have. Did I link it again? I don't know. I'll just uh, go through it quickly. 
There was uh, one good one that I remembered in there. I don't know if maybe you could find the name of it, Prof, but a guy asked when Jason was transitioning from being a caster uh, to like a, a coach, was there anything he took from being a caster analyst that helped him with being a coach? I don't know who asked that question. Yeah, I just remember reading it. That was a question. I didn't even write down the, the, the name because a lot of people asked almost the same question, which okay. is this like, like what prepared you or didn't prepare you for coming from a from a caster position to to coaching um i think i, I mean one of the big one of the obvious ones is you know more 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 big picture stuff um more of a i don't know if you guys heard that um like uh big picture stuff of being able to um I don't know. I like take it, take a take a look at this and say this is this is kind of where we're losing. We're not having this kind of map control. Actually, some of the ways in which I approach kind of looking at uh, opponents at our own team is almost like imagining like I'm casting the game as well because that's sort of the lens that I've that I've learned how to kind of deal with Counter Strike over the past few years. Um, and then and then start to kind of break that down into into smaller elements. Um, I think one of the big things is I think I think it's just the nice thing is it's just a fresh perspective. I I think I challenge a lot of of the ideas that they have as players. Um, sometimes, uh, frequently I lose that challenge, but like asking the question so that the conversations occur. I think when you're, when you're a professional player, I think one of the things that casting has helped me with the most, when you're a professional player, um, over the years, like the small fundamental details that, that grow into like the, the, the more important things kind of, kind of fade away. Like the, the building blocks of how to be a professional player and then the, the more basic elements of it. And, um, as a caster, I still very much see those those building blocks. So I mean, I, I do a lot of focus on those and make sure that all the conversations that feel like everyone's are, excuse me, already on the same page or all the pointless conversations. Um, I think as a caster, ensuring those conversations actually happen um, is a bigger deal than you'd think. Okay. Uh, there was another question uh, about like talent in terms of like casters, analysts, and stuff like that. Like now that you moved away, is there anyone that you saw come up? that maybe deserves to be in the limelight more? Uh, I mean, I think they're, they're all doing a pretty, pretty decent, okay job. I, listen, for, for a big game, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm going for, for Chad and Alex. Like when there's, when there's a big time match, um, that's, those are the guys I want casting, like the, the final, um, the big matchup, whatever it's going to be, th those guys, uh, can deliver. I think, um, I think the next, the next best, like, I guess if you want to talk about the up and coming or the new coming casters, um, the pairing that I enjoy the most is, is Scrawny and Launders. Um, I think they're, I think they're great. I mean, I like both of them outside the game, so I have a lot of fun listening to them. Um, but I think, I think they're the only like new casters, new pair came in where I feel like, I feel like they're just delivering a different product. I think most of the other casters that I hear and I listen to just sound like variations on how things have been casted for the past five years. I think Scrawny and Launders sound like they have their own new fresh thing going, which is really cool. Um, and more importantly, and this is maybe more of my nerdy business side coming in, um, I think they're they're the only real casters that have done a great job in terms of getting entirely immersed in being blast guys. They are the blast casters. They like really embody the feel of that broadcast. And I think the broadcast gets a lot of that from those two. I love the segments of them bringing in this, the skin shit that, that Scrawny does. Um, I love the segments with um, Launders has his own stuff going in his behind the scenes stuff. And he's, he's just a fun person. So I think those guys are probably doing it the best of all the new ones, but still Chad and Alex for the big time matches. I didn't even pay him to say that, ladies and gentlemen. He, he said that on his own volition. I so. told you the other day. I thought you, I thought you guys casted like a really good game when I was when I was listening to it. I think I think it, it's one of those things that comes with experience as well of being in arenas for big events and doing so many big events. It's not just like the product of the casting that you're delivering. It's also like, are you are you getting the correct emotions to cross over? Like your casting can be good, but if you're not like making everyone feel like this match is like, you know, I've heard I've heard guys do good casting except I don't feel like the match is very important. And I think Chad and Alex can deliver and make an important match feel like it's going to be the end of the world when it's over. And I've, and I've heard them make a match that probably should have been average to, to, to pretty good, like sound like it's a really important match. So um, that's, that's a pretty critical skill that I don't think enough people get good credit for. Someone in chat, Jason, asked if you'd ever come back to the talent side of things. Yeah, probably. I mean... Yeah, I mean, heaven forbid, if I ever, you know, get fired or need a new job, you know, 
Okay. I, I mean, I would consider it. It's not like I'm spurned on like never again, but yeah. I just um, think you might want to like go do what Henry's doing or go even further in that direction. Yeah. I, I mean, at the moment, I haven't, I haven't really thought about it. I have nothing against coming back, but yeah, at the moment, like being in part of the, the team side of things and being a part in the more business side of Counter-Strike is, is really intriguing and, and fun for me. I actually, one thing I am enjoying that I didn't think I would enjoy is um, the amount of a step away from social media and Reddit I've taken mm. since since doing coaching is like, I don't know, I feel kind of like an asshole to liquid because I'm not like actually driving any real engagement because I'm just like, nah, fuck Twitter, <laughs> fuck Twitter, fuck Reddit, fuck all of it. It's great. It feels a lot better. It's like, it's like, it's like losing 20 pounds. Yeah, it's not any better out there, let me tell you. Um, all right. We got many more there, Prof? I mean, nothing, nothing. Maybe one a quick one. All right. Yeah, uh, what's up, bro? question. Who is your biggest rival? Ooh. Do, do you even have a rival right now? Team wise or Jason personally? I don't know. It's an open ended one. Now that's a question. <laughs> now that's a question. I've got a couple. Um, Anders. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I, I, I don't really feel like we have a rival as liquid i think we've played we've played navi a bunch lately and that starts to feel like it can turn into some kind of a healthy rivalry um especially with how competitive the matches have been um obviously phase with with russ over there might be a natural one i i don't i don't really feel like we have a rivalry outside of maybe that navi one i think the only other thing that i'm focused on and this maybe touches back chad when you ask me goals for 2020 here's one i want to I want to reinvent with Fallen coming in and being the in-game leader and now getting into this team for a long time. One big goal, I want to I want to turn the page on this Astralis liquid rivalry. Like obviously Ooh. it has been a rivalry that's not much of a rivalry. Um but I want I want to start with the next time that we face them um is going to be a very important match match for me and I think for the team because I think that that is a matchup and that is a rivalry that we need to change the way that story is told. Um, and that, that needs to be, needs to be far more competitive a rivalry than it has been. And, and that's one thing that I know I looked at and I know when I was looking at the Katowice brackets and we had that week off and I saw that it was possible that Astralis would meet us, um, you know, that was, that was a really tantalizing matchup. So for me, being able to change the way that we talk about the Astralis first team liquid rivalry is pretty important. All right. Um, just to, just yeah. to put this into perspective there currently on a one, two, three. Four, five, Ugh. six, seven, eight, nine, ma nine match with losing streak dating back Perfect. to 2019. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, currently two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven maps streak. Um, uh, Wait, I, who's that? Wait, who's in the liquid losing to Astralis? I mean, oh, uh, yeah. Oh, well, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just putting the corner, <laughs> man. All right. Let's to be let... fair. Like yeah, all but two of these, what did I say? 10 maps, 11 maps were double Pretty digits, close. like 16, 14, yeah. 15, 13, 16, 12. All of these have been close. I will tell you, there is there is something funny when we watch Astralis play against other teams. And every once in a while, it's like, why why don't we get this? Like when we were watching the, the Astralis for Spirit demos, <laughs> I mentioned this on the counterpoints as well. There's a few rounds on the CT side where you watch Device with the AWP miss like five pretty standard easy shots that he normally hits like 10 out of 10 times. And every once in a while, when you watch that, you're just like, "Why does why does another fucker do that against us? Like, why don't why don't we play against this device? Every time we turn a corner, it's like he's just skimming one off the top every every step we take." Um, but yeah, that that I think that would be that would be a kind of, um, I mean, hopefully that you know they're in, they're in kind of a weird place as well as us right now. So hopefully both of us next time and the first time we meet, it's like we're both at a good place for our teams and we're coming in with some good momentum behind us. But that is. That is one battle that I that I want to that I want to change that I want to turn around very badly. Okay, I think what we'll do is, Jason, we'll let you go on on that lovely note right there. Cool. Uh, so what I want to do is I, I want to give you the the floor to say anything to anybody out there if you want the fans, the sponsors, your teammates. Maybe you want to call out Henry. I don't know. Maybe wait and see if. Oh, there's a rivalry that hasn't even happened yet. I've been waiting for that one. Yeah, it's gonna the be a Henry, different one, isn't it? The Henry Greer rivalry. I'll, I'll tell. Uh, I'll do. Uh, this is my outro. I mean, first of all, I, I want to thank Team Liquid and I want to thank Alienware. I know we had that conversation on the 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 stretches in Europe and the the scene and the scheduling for North American teams and how rough it can be. And I know not everyone not everyone agrees with with whatever I said, um, but truly without without the, that alienware facility that they've constructed for us over in the netherlands um these long stretches i don't even know if we'd be able to do it uh, they've, they've set up a phenomenal facility out there that um 
I know when I talk to other teams that are in less fortunate situations than us in terms of their boot camping facilities, I just feel a wave of gratitude. So um, just want to give a shout out to Liquid and shout out to, to Alienware for that because they truly are uh, critical to us having success when we're over, over in Europe. <clears throat> um, other than that, I'll tell I'll tell this story. When when I when I started coaching Liquid and and Henry this and Henry became the GM of, of Cloud Nine, um, we started I started thinking of ways that we could make that build up to any kind of a match um, to be like a little bit more exciting and have a little bit more fun. And I think we'll obviously try and do something. Uh, the two of us um, won't won't match up to the caches, obviously, but something something along those lines. Um, but one thing I did do is I messaged Liquid and I wanted to. Uh, because they he did this whole they they doing this whole thing which seems to be the the new fad nowadays and you build a new lineup is is turn them into a Marvel villain it was the Juggernaut and then it was like the the Colossus um, I did message Team Liquid behind the scenes I messaged our like apparel and our and our jersey people and I had them I had them make us a Colossus jersey because I wanted okay. I wanted to go into it and actually just be like listen bitch I'll steal your moniker I'll steal that shit have you and, just and, spoiled that now for the future. No, because what happened was we had these Colossus jerseys made and we were supposed to, there was some mix up in which jersey we'd be using in December last year when we were there for the first time around. We were supposed to be using different jerseys and that got canceled last minute before we could actually bring real jerseys. So we actually had to wear the Colossus jerseys for all of December already. Didn't get to use them for any kind of content, didn't get to use them for any kind of smack talk, but feel like it was one of those good ideas that just you know the execution didn't really work out the way you wanted it to the intent was there and what I'm gonna yeah do, as 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 we uh bid you a, a farewell is uh you're playing astralis in 18 days from now so uh yeah we're in the same group in um in, in EPL. yeah so you might get that chance right there to start writing the the first page of that book or the next chapter I the suppose. next chapter yeah first yeah. chapter sucked it was a bad read it's one of those books you have to you know really dive into it before it starts getting good yeah, I, look, I'm not great on reading, so maybe this is one that I might have to sink my teeth into. Now, uh, Lucas, are we? Uh, how are we going to get? Uh, this sounds horrible. How are we going to part ways with Jason here? You got to. He can just leave. All right, Jason. Cool. Can just leave. Right. Thank you for joining us. It's been fantastic. Yeah, glad we Thanks got to make this work. Out. Thanks a bunch, guys. Bye, Jason. See you. Yeah, all right, I love an awkward goodbye. Uh, we're quickly going to go over the pro league, pro league, the pro league group. We'll just go over Group A just quickly, I suppose, uh, just to, to close this one out because uh, we've obviously run a bit over like normal. Lucas, I've linked it just there. Uh, let's bring this one up for everybody playing at home, and uh, we'll close the showdown after we get over this. So, twenty-four teams uh, over. I think it's a five-week span. Um, the teams are broken up into four separate groups of six teams. The top three teams from each group progress uh, to some stage of the playoffs. The first place team in every group goes into a play playing environment to play against other top teams. We spoke about the format in the past, but now we've had the groups and we'll just quickly break this down a bit of a preview. So group A, we have big heroic complexity, OG renegades, FPX. Three of these teams, actually one. Yeah. Three of these teams have just made roster changes striker. And one of them is from Australia. So hey, can you make any predictions with this group? Um, <laughs> it's a tough one, isn't it's it? It's fucked, isn't it? I'm looking at it, looking at it now. It's heroic four, essentially, if you count in Condor, uh, Fun Plus Phoenix. Uh, FPX, OG, heroic. heroic Renegades. I, I'm mean, not, no one... I said they're from Australia. Don't, if they made a roster change, it wouldn't even matter. Right? Okay, got so it. Don't worry about that. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, I mean, just look out for big and complexity to, to do well. Or Let's, What's the, I, the what is it? Like, the... sort of two teams that have been up and down quite quite a bit yeah uh, so they are not the super stable picks either oh. uh, yeah uh which is kind of awful. like complexity did well in this qualifier which gave me some confidence so i'll i'm like leaning towards them as being the safe pick i guess big also should be there should be but this is like a great group for like renegades to actually upset i know i agree it's not it's not like high chance they're not favored to finish top three here but if ever then this is like a great opportunity like you have to think about these guys come to events get first seeded against astralis or liquid all the fucking time yep and then they're in the lower bracket playing against another pretty good team and that's it that's the end of the tournament for them 99 percent of the time which is super trash now they don't have that much pressure they're not going to go directly into the lower bracket have to fight elimination so I, I don't know. Let's see if they can do something. Also, fuck them for not saying who the in-game leader is. That's pretty annoying. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'll try and tailor this one a little bit more specific for you then, Striker. Looking at this group, right, with what Prof has just said, and I'm sure that we probably all roughly agree on this, that you have the two more stable names, but they're not infallible. Then you have the three teams who are good, but they've all just made roster changes, so we don't know what to expect. And then you have Renegades, right? So just let's say Renegades in that complete dark horse could beat anybody, could also get owned by anybody, right? Whereas when we look at OG with Nico standing in, we look at FPX with Sunny standing in, and we look at Heroic adding Shush and adding Refresh, this is the first real impressions. Obviously, the qualifier that's going on yeah. now, don't worry about that. But this is the first impressions where they're going to get uh, a round-robin environment, lots of games. Which team do you think has the potential to make that third slot out of the three let's not include renegades for this discussion because i think we all know that they can upset but it's less so less the, likely the first two being a big complexity obviously yep. um so the last spot is basically like we're, we're basically blindly measuring here right i the, the thing is like i'd almost say fpx just out of wanting to be a bit edgy but it's sure. not even that it's not even that uh, that i am it's just that They've done super well considering their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And even like this crazy situation where they're getting a stand in who's actually the in game leader. I just kind of have that feeling where they, they might do well in this group. I, I'm not sure if they're going to be in the third spot, but I, I do think they're going to take some wins off the other teams. Yeah. What do you think, Prof? Do you agree with that? You think that be because of their instability, they're the most stable? Uh, I'm leaning towards heroic out of these teams. All right. Why? Uh, well, they. What are their results? Like, I saw some results. I can't remember what they were. Just they got through today pretty easily yeah, through the qualifier. They, they beat Voivoda and Cloud9. Doesn't really seem like much, but other teams struggled against the same same yeah. squads. Mm -hmm. so, like, it was a super close series against Cloud9. They were looking a bit shaky, and it was pretty clear that they had a new team still in that, in that series, but it was still good that they game, went through. Yeah, so, like, I'm leaning towards them. Like, they have the most kind of tenure on the top level, the three that they have, though. Uh, and the the players that they got are pretty strong. So whoa, I, whoa, I think whoa. it's cool. You have something playing in your Yeah, boots. I'm fixing it. I don't even know where the fuck that's from. I'm, I'm, just... I'm leaning towards the right here. Yeah, I I, eh, I kind of like what Strike is going with because they're so used to having a fifth who isn't their fifth that they and they're still getting results. It's a weird group. It's not a great group. Um, it's not one that's getting. I think crazy it's going to be excited. a crazy one, to be honest. Like it's like the, it's not going to be like you know the top team is going to get five wins. The, the, gonna the be next team those... is going to get four wins. It's going to be like one of those fucking insane uh, tiebreaker scenarios where yeah. like four teams are going to tie for first place. Whether that's even possible, I don't even know at this point. Yeah, I think it is. And Renegade um, is going to come off the group. Yeah, somehow. <laughs> I, look, yeah. they've been here for a while now, right? They've been boot camping now for about a month. So if we're going to see like the best stuff they have to offer, it has to be soon, right? Like you, you, can, you can't spend the entire year here, obviously coming from behind. But mm. um, we also have Group B. I forgot that that continues on that week. So just quickly with, with, with Group B here, for those people playing at home, we have Vitality, G2, Mousebots, Phase, NIP, and Ents. Um, so there, obviously, we, we just the quick storylines, right? Uh, Ents have their refresh roster. They're looking like not horrible compared to where Ents was at. Diha, not too bad. NIP... Uh, same deal with NIP has felt like me they're in the same boat for the last year. Just the same same place. Yep. Phase versus Mouse, really cool stories there. Uh, G2 versus Phase, really cool stories there. Vitality, how are they going to bounce back after a lackluster result? Is this another group, Prof, that you look at and you go, fuck, like it, it's going to be kind of similar. It's yeah. kind of similar. Uh, it's like a lot of proving to be done for like almost every team. Vitality to show that they're not that it was like a blip on the radar that they're not going down like a downward direction g2 that they can pull off this shit with with nico opping or not opping yeah, which we don't geez, really know what's going on mouse ports okay they had a decent debut i think so they're still super super early into into that team into the big roster change uh phase yeah same shit nip same shit and then are kind of the underdog dark horse here can they pull off some upsets off of these teams? Maybe make it through. Who knows? I that that's kind of the story for me. Everything's in the air, but like vitality should be taking it right. If if they are the vitality of, of last year, and I think with with that sentiment striker there, that it is another messy group, and that there is you know one team that kind of seems like they or a couple of teams who seem like they should be above the rest. Do you think this is where we get? I'm trying to work out how to word this. Uh, 
when I say better Counter Strike, I don't mean better in terms of like the decision making. I mean better in terms of the action. Do you think with these type of groups and new rosters and that that we will get more chaotic CS, or do you think it'll just play out like it has been with a lot of saving, and very slow rounds? What what is your take on the type of Counter Strike we're going to get with these roster changes? I mean, considering what happened, I mean, phase are definitely going more in the. I'm not going to say chaotic, but definitely not like in the super safe play style with Kerrigan coming in. And we've we've already seen that kind of like change up with, with FaZe uh, in general in the first tournament that they played together. Um, generally, like these rosters are not like the super standard level of play um, teams. You know, if you look at G2 are kind of the same thing, like um, they can be quite volatile as well. Then IP are the, it's almost funny that then IP, apart from Vitality, of course, are like the most stable, I guess, in terms yeah. of a play style, you know? So I think you're kind of right in, in, in thinking that it might it might get a bit chaotic. Yeah, and, and this is this is the thing, right? With the fact that it is round robin and now there's more stakes on getting that first place in the group. Like this is gonna be this might we've been very lucky in the last couple of years with group stages at EPL events where we've avoided having these crazy ties, but yeah, it, it almost it feels happen. inevitable. It will happen somewhere, like, yeah, for especially sure. with these first two groups. Like it, it actually ugh. Yeah, I actually have the most interesting storyline for me uh, mm -hmm. is is about Zaiwu actually. Like his okay. his yearly rating is only 1.22. So that's oh, like dear. it's just like a player almost. What? It's almost yeah. like he's he's not he's a god. Not a god. So what's God stat? What what would 1. it 1.35 yeah. or something like that? That's like simple as on that like classic level, 1.30 something. Right, okay. uh, and uh, Zaiwu not not that not that great for for his standard, right? Okay. So I'm curious to see uh, in which direction that goes. Uh, obviously, with Nivera coming in on more maps as things goes on, picking up the op quite more, maybe getting some more space. Maybe that's the thing that is that is kind of affecting Zaiwu. We'll see. Of course, this sounds like he's in in a massive slump, which is not the case, but. It's uh, interesting to to follow if he if he posts another like one ten rating like he did in Katowice. That's I'd say that's concerning for yeah. vitality. Definitely concerning. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, I like right. that. Uh, I guess as well if we just if if like for those people who might be asking for a reason to watch Mouse Sports versus Phase. If you're not familiar, obviously it'd be like Dexter Carrigan situation. That'd be the same as G2 Phase. You've got Cold Zero, Nico, Nico Carrigan. No, you've got like there's so many like juicy things with those matchups there that, that should be exciting to watch. Yeah, so uh, it's going to be a lot of Counter Strike. It's what is it like fucking uh, for the next three weeks or whatever? It's every basically every day. Every every Tuesday days, yeah. from next week is is an off day. Otherwise, it's just lots of Counter Strike, lots of round robins. Um, I, I guess we shouldn't until we cover all the groups, talk about playoffs and that kind of stuff. We'll save yeah. that. Um, I guess we're we're probably done, boys. Are, are yeah. we done? We're done. We're done. All right. Uh, so this has been episode thirty. We're going to be back next Tuesday. Tuesday next Tuesday, eight p.m. We don't have a guest just yet. Uh, we'll work on that. We'll see who we can find. Maybe somebody from the groups just played. Maybe somebody going into the groups about to be played. Um, as always, you can go to anchor.fm slash HLTV to get uh, the audio options for this. Spotify, Apple, bloody Google, podcast, all that shit's in there. You can listen to it on all your devices. Uh, head over to YouTube as well for the VOD. Now, that normally takes somewhere between 24 and 48 hours. to Check that one out, and it should be up pretty quick. And all in all, uh, yeah, thank you again to Extrify and thank you for everybody for tuning in. We'll be back uh, in a week and a bit's time. So we'll see you then.